Thank you. We arrive. Um, Sergeant, will you begin your recordings? According to the computer, begun. Working in the cloud started. Backup is rolling. Thank you. Good morning, and welcome to today's New York City Council Remote Hearing and Hospitals. At this time, with all panelists, please turn on your videos. Thank you. To minimize disruption, please place all electronic devices to vibrate or silent mode. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at council testimony at council testimony at uh, the nyc.gov. I repeat, council testimony at nyc.gov. Chair, Chair Rivera, we are ready to begin. Good morning, everyone. I am Councilmember Carlina Rivera, Chair of the Committee on Hospitals. And I want to start by thanking everyone present today. I know for many of you, your presence here is not easy. So I want to thank you for being here. I'd like to um, acknowledge uh, my colleagues. I'm just checking to see if any of them have joined us yet. And if not, we will acknowledge them as they show up to the hearing. We are all here today to discuss the wellness and health of New York City interns and residents. And I'd like to start by acknowledging the incredible work of residents during the COVID-19 pandemic. Residency programs were already difficult and working during the coronavirus pandemic amplified these difficulties significantly. Residents' anxieties, some new and others longstanding, ran the gamut from concerns about disruptions to their education, to fears of exposure to the virus due to widespread shortages of personal protection equipment. As more established physicians and nurses publicly cried out for protective gear and better pay, residents largely suffered in silence afraid that speaking up might cost them their careers. Even when some residents did demand hazard pay and financial benefits, such as increased disability insurance, they were denied without any discussion. Today, those of us who aren't in your shoes will do our best to empathize and understand. However, I'd like to say upfront that I know we ultimately cannot know the depths of the impact of the pandemic on you and your work. We cannot understand the magnitude of the trauma that you experienced. And we hope that this forum can help you share and shed some light on that. Thank you for your tireless efforts and thank you for taking the time and for sharing today. I'd also like to acknowledge the fear of retaliation. Many residents feel when discussing their working conditions mental health and overall well-being. All residents should feel safe providing feedback about their programs without fear of retaliation. I know this isn't the reality. I want all residents, including those who wish to participate today and cannot because of fear or because of their schedules that I see them and that my thoughts are with them as well today. That said, becoming a doctor is not easy. It's stressful, it's competitive, and it's expensive. Residents are inadequately paid. According to a study published in the American Journal of Surgery, resident salaries do not reflect the number of hours worked and are not comparable to those of other medical staff. Despite residents' comparatively low salaries, it is expensive to become a physician. A large majority of medical students graduate with debt, including 73% of graduates in 2019 who had a median educational debt of $200,000. Residency programs are strenuous. Although there are federal and state level protections in place regarding work hours, it is not enough. The policies are simply not strong enough. Rates of suicide, depression, and burnout are high. According to a survey of 700 residents performed by the Committee of Interns and Residents, 
Doctors are two times more likely to commit suicide than those in other professions. And 10% of fourth year medical students and first year residents report having suicidal thoughts. Female doctors are four times more likely to commit suicide than women in other professions. A study released in 2017 found that suicide was the leading cause of death for male residents and the second leading cause of death for female residents. Drivers of burnout, suicide, and poor well being in residency include their long work hours and student debt, as well as a culture of hazing and bullying, out of title work, and a lack of mental health services. Since the COVID 19 crisis began, morale has dipped even more significantly. So today I ask while facing the emotional, physical, and financial stressors of the pandemic, on top of typical residency-related stress, what additional support have hospitals provided to residents to help them? Several hospitals have created programming to provide mental health and wellness resources for their staff, including Health and Hospitals Helping Healers Heal program and New York Presbyterian's COPE NYP. Greater New York Hospital Association formed a clinician well-being advisory group which focuses exclusively on the issues faced by frontline providers. We were able to learn about these programs as well as others during a hearing in June 2020 that this committee held about the mental health of frontline healthcare workers. While these programs seem helpful, I am still concerned. We need to make sure that wellness programs are accessible to residents and that they are safe spaces. There is much stigma baked into the healthcare profession with regards to seeking and receiving mental health services. Additionally, no matter how well a person tries to engage with mental health and wellness programming, residents remain overworked and underpaid. Structural issues within residency programs, such as hours, working conditions, pay and benefits, should also be examined and meaningfully addressed. Today, we look forward to continuing to discuss how New York City's hospitals have worked to support healthcare workers, specifically residents in their training with a particular focus on their wellness and mental health. The committee also hopes to hear more from hospitals about how their programming specifically supports residents and the metrics used to show the success of such programming. Just as the coronavirus pandemic did not create, but rather highlighted existing systemic racial and socioeconomic inequalities, it also highlighted systemic issues in medical training. We as a city and as a country must learn from this pandemic and prioritize improving the health and well being of interns and residents. I would like to thank the hospital committee staff, Council, Harbani Ahuja. Policy Analyst M. Bulkin, Finance Analyst Lauren Hunt, Data Analyst Rachel Alexandrov, my whole team, especially Isabel Chandler, and of course the entire council staff, our technical experts, our surgeon at arms for creating this space for everyone. Thank you all for being here. I'm now going to turn it over to our committee council, Harbani Ahuja, to go over some procedural items. Thank you, Chair. My name is Harbani Huja, and I'm counsel to the Committee on H Hospitals for the New York City Council. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify when you will be unmuted by the host. I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called, and I will be periodically announcing who the next panelist will be. For everyone testifying today, please note that there may be a few seconds of delay before you are unmuted and we thank you in advance for your patience. All hearing participants should submit written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. At today's hearing, the first panel will be representatives from the administration, followed by council member questions, and then the public will testify. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, please use a Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order, in the order in which you have raised your hands. I will now call on members from the administration to testify. Testimony will be provided by Dr. Omar Fatal, Deputy Medical Director, Office of Behavioral Health. 
Additionally, the following representatives will be available for answering questions. Jeremy Segal, Assistant Vice President, Chief Wellness Officer. Dr. Donnie Bell, Deputy Chief Medical Officer. And Dr. Michelle Allen, Chief Medical Officer. Before we begin, I will administer the oath. Dr. Fatal, Jeremy Segal, Donnie, Dr. Donnie Bell, and Dr. Allen, I will call on you each individually for a response. Please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Dr. Fatal? Yes, I do. Thank you. Jeremy Segal? I do. Thank you. Dr. Bell? Yes. Thank you. And Dr. Allen? Yes, I do. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Fatal, you may begin your testimony when you are ready. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Rivera and members of the Committee on Hospitals. I am Dr. Omar Fatal, Deputy Medical Director at the Office of Behavioral Health at NYC Health and Hospitals, or Health and Hospitals in Brief. I'm pleased to be joined this morning by Dr. Donnie Bell, Deputy Chief Medical Officer, and Jeremy Segal, Chief Wellness Officer at Health and Hospitals. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you to discuss NYC interns and residents' wellness and health. Health and Hospitals has a long history of taking care of the most vulnerable New Yorkers. Its mission is to extend to all New Yorkers comprehensive and equitable health services of the highest quality in an atmosphere of humane care, dignity, and respect, regardless of their language spoken, immigration status, gender, sexual orientation, disability, or ability to pay. In the same way that we take care of everyday New Yorkers and patients, it's a critical part of our mission to also take care of our staff and train staff, including interns, residents, and fellows, also referred to as trainees or house staff. Through its own sponsored programs, affiliations, and away rotations, Health and Hospitals trains approximately 2,700 residents and fellows annually through our GME offices, in addition to medical students. Health and Hospitals is especially unique in that it, we train a high number of foreign medical graduates, which we are very proud of. The breadth of training spans from primary care, behavioral health, and dental medicine, which are the foundation of health and preventative medicine, to highly advanced specialty and subspecialty services, including interventional cardiology, surgical subspecialties, and other medical subspecialties. Our trainees have numerous academic publications, awards, and honors at national conferences and amongst national professional societies. As COVID-19 surged and most New Yorkers were urged to stay home, health and hospitals care workers, including its trainees, courageously stepped into the front lines to battle the virus. The loss of patients and colleagues was devastating, even as the work was unrelenting. Our staff were and still are experiencing an immense amount of emotional, psychological trauma and stress. Health and Hospitals is fortunate to have two strong teams to support for support programs, Behavioral Health Services and Helping Healers Heal program, or as known as H3 program. H3 is the foundational infrastructure for enhanced wellness programming across all service lines of health and hospitals to address various needs of all staff. Initially, the H3 program focused on adverse events and second victimization. But with the arrival of COVID-19, the program became more holistic, proactive, and preventative, reaching out to staff members, establishing relationships, and creating safe spaces to decompress and share personal and professional experiences. In addition to our standard wellness program for our trainees during pre-pandemic times, we also put in place several support mechanisms for our trainees during COVID-19 surge, including a Battle Buddies program, monthly safe space debriefing sessions for trainees, 
town hall sessions to give our trainees a voice, food support, and COVID-19 related compensation. Each of our acute and post-acute facilities also set up wellness respite areas or designated physical spaces for staff to use as temporary reprieve from work duties. Sites fill their wellness respite areas with murals, paintings, cards of appreciation, relaxation activities, art therapies, and various snacks and beverages to fortify the staff's morale and spirits. H3 holistic wellness programming has evolved over the last few years and continues to address the emotional and psychological needs of our staff through debriefs, including, but not limited to, acute reaction to unanticipated and adverse work-related events, reaction to stress, secondary vicarious complex and collective traumatization, as well as compassion fatigue and burnout. At Health and Hospitals, we understand that while residency and fellowship years are a time of tremendous growth and can be very rewarding, they can also bring some challenges. That's why we have developed a dedicated webpage for our trainees to turn to for wellness resources. The webpage, House Staff Safety and Wellness Resource page, is accessible from inside and outside of Health and Hospitals Network and allow residents and fellows to take advantage of a wide range of services. It's dedicated to all house staff across health and hospitals, regardless of their academic affiliation or pay line. Services and resources include a concierge service that connects house staff who are self-referred with mental health or substance use treatment services, including evaluation, consultation, short-term psychotherapy, counseling, or medication management. Information on the 1-800-NYC well, a 24-7 crisis referral line. Information on the Health and Hospitals system-wide anonymous emotional staff support hotline. Free and confidential hotlines to discuss challenges. E-learning courses to address emotional and psychological distress, depression and suicide, burnout, and promote well-being peer-to-peer -peer programs that allow house staff and medical students an opportunity to talk with a peer about some of life's stressors, link to the Helping Healers Here program, Trauma Recovery Network, a local team of the EMDR Humanitarian Assistance Program, which provides pro bono EMDR therapy to first responders and frontline medical professionals who have experienced critical incidents, and Residence Information Portal, which provides valuable resources to the house staff, including contact numbers, benefits information, and other practical resources. In addition, we also have a house staff wellness work group that's comprised of medical and professional affairs, GME, human resources, behavioral health services, care experience, workforce wellness, CIR resident members, as well as several attendings and a frontline nurse that meets every first Friday of every month. The structured work group was established in December 2020 to focus on wellness efforts specifically for interns, residents, and fellows with the intention of establishing effective community building and communication across all residency programs to foster a culture of accountability, to enhance pathways to support and treatment, and to nurture infrastructure for information and resource sharing. Recent recommendations from the resident wellness work groups that have been implemented at health and hospitals include a communication campaign to reach the resident to residents more directly, required onboarding of incoming new residents to learn about H3, H3 trainings for DIOs, GME directors, associate program directors, program directors, and chief residents conducted at the facility, leveraging other forums and platforms geared to younger generations as emails are not always the preferred method of correspondence, and building in wellness discussions to protected time curriculum and speaking more widely about wellness during grand rounds, departmental meetings, morbidity and mortality conferences, et cetera. At Health and Hospitals, we value each employee and their physical, emotional, and psychological safety, and wellness is our top priority. Health and Hospitals has and will continue to support our frontline workers. We're always looking for ways to improve, in ways that we deliver care to our patients, as well as in the work environment for our trainees and staff. Thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today on this important topic. 
and we're happy to address any questions you may have at this time. Thank you so much for your testimony. I'm now going to turn it over to questions from Chair Rivera. Uh, panelists from the administration, please stay unmuted if possible during this question and answer period. Um, thank you, Chair Rivera. Thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony. Um, I, I really appreciate some of the details that you gave in terms of how you support residents with feelings of, of burnout and depression. But if we can just even go through it even, I, I wanna say a bit, a bit more simpler. So if someone has these feelings, if someone is looking for support and assistance, what do you recommend that they do as an intern or a resident? And how do you create a safe space for that person if they came to you today and asked for help? Yes, and that's exactly what the Helping Years Here program and infrastructure is set up to do. And it's a tiered uh, program where people start exactly with the initial entry and then it gets escalated as needed. And for that, I'm gonna turn to my colleague, Jeremy Segal, who can walk us through how that happens. Uh, good morning, Chair and Council members. Really do appreciate the opportunity to speak about NYC Health and Hospitals Enterprise-wide Helping Healers Heal, also known as H3 program. Uh, so uh, just to give a little bit of framework as to what a Helping Healers Heal debrief is, um, it's an emotional support encounter. It's meant to be a peer-to-peer -peer mutual program uh, that can be conducted by anyone, whether they are a licensed mental or behavioral health clinician, uh, an environmental service worker, patient transporter, uh, or even a doctor or resident themselves. Uh, so an emotional support debrief can be triggered in a multitude of different ways. Uh, we have through the Helping Healers Heal website, you have an opportunity to trigger a, a response support encounter. Um, and what happens is, is that at each and every individual site, we have a Helping Healers Heal lead, as well as what we call trained peer support champions. So trained peer support champions are those that have gone through enhanced empathy skill building trainings, uh, as well as a training to cover our concrete resources that are made available to all NYC Health and Hospitals employees and affiliates, despite service line, clinical and non-clinical setting, um, a, a, as well as site. So the way it works is if it's uh, triggered through the portal, uh, the Helping Healers Heal lead would uh, receive uh, um, the encounter request, uh, which at times can either be done anonymous by an employee for themselves or for someone else. It can be uh, an encounter for an entire service area unit, um, or it can be something in terms of you typing in your own name or someone else's name and the best contact number and time to, to reach that staff member. Uh, once the encounter is engaged, uh, peer support champion is assigned or the H3 lead will handle it themselves. Uh, and there's a four-step model in terms of emotional support debriefing, which includes an introduction, really laying the groundwork or foundational elements of what a, a Helping Healers Heal debrief is, framing it as a non-clinical intervention uh, that is meant to engage someone with empathy, compassion, resource sharing, and follow-up. Uh, the second uh, step to this debrief is really to do the exploration phase, asking open-ended questions in a more motivational interviewing uh, process, uh, as well as um, first aid critical response sensitivity uh, manner. The next step really is the follow-up of sharing resources uh, if a staff member requests it or, or if it is recommended. Uh, and of course, the last step is to ensure that there is some connection to an alternate level of care if that is asked for by the staff member. Um, and that's just one way that it can be triggered. We also have operationalized Helping Healers Heal and really have seen maturation and sophistication with the programming over the last uh, three and a half years. Uh, so often in the morning safety huddles, uh, if there's an adverse patient event or outcome, uh, if we've learned about uh, a staff member's unfortunate, um, you know, an accident in the community or a terminal diagnosis or, or something of that nature, uh, we are much more proactive in terms of sending a Helping Healers Heal debrief there. Uh, so word of mouth, telephone calls, emails, texts, as well as the portal itself is how a Helping Healers Heal um, debrief can be triggered. In terms of a group setting, we all know that working across the landscape of healthcare can be exceptionally challenging, especially for future generations of providers of care. 
Um, so what we want to make sure is that this is available across all disciplines, departments, and tours. Uh, so if there is a patient that came in through the ICU that multiple tours, multiple disciplines or departments uh, supported, and um, if that patient unfortunately succumbs to an illness or, or an injury, we want to make sure that we can debrief the entire service area. Uh, so that's us really making sure that we remove the staff members from that area if possible, finding a safe, quiet, comfortable environment uh, where confidentiality um, it can be upheld, and to really just make sure that we're empathetically supporting those individuals. And that's the same thing for an individual debrief. Uh, we try to remove them from that work environment, whether it's take a walk, sit in a private office, uh, in a staff lounge, or one of our, our workforce wellness rooms. Uh, we want to make sure that we're empathetically connecting. Um, and that's a little bit more about the concrete process of an H3 debrief. And if I may add, uh, specifically for mental health services, if a really a house staff or resident is interested in talking to someone, we have multiple uh, options for them. They can call the 1-800-NYC-1247 and talk to a crisis counselor and be connected with services. Or they can call, call our internal health and hospitals anonymous support hotline and they get a call back and they can talk to a licensed counselor from Behavior Health or they can request services directly. And in that case, they can use the concierge service, which is a person who is dedicated for the service who's available Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. And that individual will connect the house staff with a therapist or a psychiatrist if that's what the house staff chooses. So I think what we're saying is that we have multiple different ways of entry. And as you mentioned, Cherry Vera, at the beginning, stigma is a big barrier. And one of the ways that we're trying to break stigma is to make it easier for people to receive help by giving them multiple different options. Some of them are anonymous, some of them are online, some of them are in person, so that they can pick the one that they're comfortable with. So the, I understand the concierge service that, that, that you mentioned where there's mental health support and substance abuse support, you even mentioned medication management. And then there are the trained peer support champions who are assigned. Are the trained peer support champions uh, full-time permanent personnel? Is there a chance of that person not being the same person? I'm just trying to lend to consistency because I also know, you know, this, this stigma is absolutely real. It's cultural as well. And I, and I think, you know, uh, I appreciate the layers, but I also know that sometimes people might be hesitant if they're, you know, passed from person to person. There's a trust that has to be established there for someone to be truly open. So is a trained peer support champion someone, uh, you know, a permanent full-time person, you know, who are they? Yeah, I, our fundamental philosophy is that wellness is more than just mental health and we you know we don't want to send the message that wellness directly means mental health and that's why we have the wider infrastructure for the helping healers here and then some people end up uh working with mental health providers but i would turn to my colleague jeremy Segal, who can explain specifically uh and answer your question for continuity purposes each and every single uh one of our 11 acute care hospitals, every single one of our five post-acute uh, and across our ambulatory care as well as community care service lines, we have assigned full-time uh, employees um, that have additional helping him heal responsibilities. Uh, they are the fixture point in addition to our directors of psychiatry where behavioral services are available. Uh, in terms of a peer support champion, a peer support champion is a colleague, a peer, literally on the front line, whether they're clinical or non-clinical. And the idea is that we want to have a peer support champion identified in each and every single department uh, so that there is continuity within their own backyard, within their own work environment, so that they can be debriefed or be supported by their own uh, colleagues in, in and around their area. Uh, a peer support champion can be assigned to uh, an individual or group debrief or a wellness event. Um, and the idea is if they have engaged in that encounter, we would want them to continuously follow up until the encounter closes out. And usually these encounters usually only have one additional follow up. Uh, and if at that point in time, they're requesting a higher level of support, if you will, and that is not always just a, a licensed mental health uh, clinician, uh, that could be speaking to chaplaincy services or a risk manager um, or, or the EAP. Um, the idea is that we want that same friendly face uh, that already engaged with them to be the same person that is following up with them. The Helping Healers Heal Leads and the Director of Psychiatry are, are those fixed persons that are able to conduct and make sure that the, the care and support is, is continuous, if you will. 
Uh, a peer support champion, again, is someone that has been trained in empathy skill building, uh, as well as the concrete resources uh, that we offer, as well as signs and symptoms of compassion fatigue, burnout, vicarious complex, as well as collective traumatization uh, and second victimization, as well as stress on a continuum. Uh, so these trained peer support champions are really meant to be just anyone, pedestrians, anyone in our own um, walls within our facilities that are able to, to just provide humanity and healthcare again. Thank you. I just want to recognize we've been joined by council members Diaz and Ayala. So, and I, I appreciate again everything that, that you're mentioning in terms of how you are trying to address the traumatic experiences that interns and residents have suffered. And when you all testified in June 2020, you did mention this program, which is peer led, it's a wellness program, it offers emotional first aid to healthcare providers. Uh, and I guess my question is, how has it changed during the pandemic? What are the changes that have been made since we last spoke? And you mentioned the portal quite a bit, which is a, a great place for resources, but it, is the program fully implemented in all of the 11 hospitals and other h, &H facilities? Jeremy, do you want to clarify yes, that one? Uh, absolutely. Uh, so Helping Healers Heal uh, has continued to evolve. Uh, as mentioned back in early 2018, it was started as the second victim response initiative. Uh, as we began to uh, pick up and support uh, the concretization of the program across all of our sites, which it does include our 11 acute care hospitals, our five post-acute sites, our Gotham Ambulatory Care Service Line and Community Care, um, all of which uh, were trained, uh, identified peer support champions, uh, H3 leads were identified, and then internal H3 steering teams were established that are um, interdisciplinary, multiple, multi-level uh, steering teams at each of those sites. Um, the whole thing about Helping Healers Seal is I come from a quality improvement background and there's two pillars of quality improvement. One, respect for people and two, continuous improvement. Uh, so we consistently are crowdsourcing, trying to understand how we can continue to enhance our services and to improve over time. So it started second victimization. It began to evolve into be, to be more inclusive of vicarious traumatization, compassion fatigue, and burnout. And at the turn of 2020, with uh, the onset of COVID-19, that is when we aligned to six dimensions of well-being. And now we have aligned to eight dimensions of well-being, making Helping Healers Heal not just about uh, crisis response efforts and stress on a continuum, but to be more about choice. Uh, one that recognizes, honors all experiences, both personal and professional, and how that impacts our workforce at, at their um, point of entry in terms of wherever they provide services, clinical or non-clinical. So NYC Health and Hospitals created an internal definition. Um, and so workforce wellness is, again, not just about mental and emotional support. It's it's, it's defined as an active pursuit of new life skills and becoming aware of and making conscious choices toward a balanced and more fulfilling lifestyle to align to our eight dimensions so that we can support our staff in a more successful existence. Our goal ever since the pandemic is to reach a state of where we are flourishing, no longer surviving, but thriving again, to be able to realize our full potentials, both inside and outside of work, despite our adversities. So we, um, throughout the pandemic, we um, launched our COVID-19 guidance and resource page, which had its own wellness um, page and information that also um, connects to the house staff webpage that Dr. Fatal had mentioned. We launched just-in-time crisis response trainings, which was 30 minutes of digestible content by internal and external subject matter experts that were pre-recorded, slide decks uploaded that any staff member could um, watch at their own leisure. We've reached over 6,300 staff members with these just-in-time trainings, which is more about how can you cope and help someone else cope through challenging uh, moments in life, both with COVID-19 due to civil unrest due to racial injustice, as well as global affairs. Uh, we, of course, had our anonymous counseling um, support hotline that was launched by the Office of Behavioral Health that's been utilized uh, over 200 times and connected staff members to the EAP or ongoing therapeutic services. Uh, we launched our wellness uh, respite rooms as well as at times turned them into morning rooms. So we have 31 of those at this point in time. Uh, we did in-kind uh, management of donations in terms of protein shakes, bottles of water, um, canned goods, grocery bags, things of that nature, as well as establish what we call proactive unit-based wellness rounds. 
which is bringing the support and care into their work environment, both clinical and non-clinical areas of all of our sites across all service lines, and established wellness events, which are events not only for recognition and appreciation of our staff, but nonverbal processes using the healing powers of arts and creative expression um, for further in introspection as well as a cathartic experience. We also established standing debriefs. Um, if there were staff members that couldn't this, receive a so proactive sorry. wellness, is this how the program has changed? Is this this is how it, it has evolved? How, yeah. how in all in these changes, are you incorporating residents themselves in the evolution of the process? And I guess how would you measure the success of the program? What metrics are you using? And and would you be able to share those metrics with us? Absolutely. Uh, so first and foremost, we always want the voice of the customer, whoever else, who is going to be receiving services to have a voice in it. Again, the whole point of well-being is to see your own self represented in those services so that it can be um, an opportunity for choice. Um, and, and that's how we build trust and respect, and that's how we also begin to destigmatize uh, utilization of services. Uh, so we do have resident members on our resident wellness work group. Uh, we also, at times, have done pulse check surveys as well as a system-wide NYC Health and Hospital staff wellness survey, uh, which received input from a multitude of departments, disciplines, uh, as well as roles, uh, including residents themselves. So to, to further answer, the, the program has evolved to the eight dimensions of well-being, which is us establishing emotional, environmental, occupational, financial, physical, intellectual, social, and spiritual well-being programming uh, that is available to all NYC Health and Hospitals employees. In terms of measurability, again, I come from a quality improvement background, so if we cannot measure it, how do we know where we are and where we need to go and if we are actually improving services? So in terms uh, of our scorecard uh, that we bring into every single workforce wellness task force, this is something that's also shared across all our H3 steering committee, which is the enterprise level, as well as the individual facility level, as well as brought into the resident wellness work group. Um, so visits to wellness rooms from January 2020 to July 2021, we've had 83,187 visits by staff members. And again, those are physical spaces that are enhanced to offer uh, debriefing support or just a respite area for staff to relax and rejuvenate and reconnect to themselves. In terms of the proactive unit-based wellness rounds that I was mentioning, since January 2020 up until July 2021, we've had 34,648 proactive wellness rounds, which again are proactive psychological supportive discussions with staff uh, that regularly occur in their own areas. Uh, our anonymous support hotline, uh, we've had 200 calls uh, since the inception. And again, this is an internal support H&H &H hotline for all employees and affiliates uh, that are staffed by licensed mental health clinicians to provide psychological and emotional support and referrals to other services if needed. In terms of the H3 foundational element of emotional support debriefing, we track all of our encounters. So, and again, the encounter can be either a one-on-one -on -one debrief, a group debrief, a wellness event or a combined type as we call it. So from January 2020 to July 2021, uh, we've had 1,814 individual debriefs. We've had 2,920 group debriefs uh, and we've had 327 wellness events. Uh, in terms of the combined type, we've had 346 combined types of either one-on-one -on -one that turned to group debriefs or group debriefs that turned into one-on-one, -on -one, and we've touched over 5,407 staff members with these encounters. We also track how many peer support champions we have across the system that have been trained with our Helping Healers Heal or Hero New York training. Uh, from January 2020 to July 2021, we've had 923 uh, peer support champions chained, and of course, this is a number that fluctuates and goes up and down. The Battle Buddy Support Program that Omar, uh, Dr. Patel mentioned in his testimony, uh, that was launched in November of 2020. And what this is, is it's an informal additional layer to our three-tiered process for, for peer support, uh, which is an additional safety net, if you will, of eyes, ears, arms, and hearts on the floor. So if I'm a resident and want to speak to another resident uh, in another program within the same facility or a program at another facility or even a different discipline, we've had 574 staff members um, uh, utilize this service. And so what Can it I, is, is they fill out. Thank you so much for these numbers. I guess my, my question is also, how often are residents surveyed about these programs and their experiences using these programs? 83,000 visits is, sounds like a very, very impressive number. Of course, these are, these are also spaces where people can relax and take a minute. So my follow-up question also, 
in addition to how often our residents surveyed about these programs and their experiences using these programs is how do you ensure that <clears throat> interns and residents are able to access the program, especially with their busy schedules? Uh, thank you for that question. These are great questions. So uh, we survey uh, at a system-wide or enterprise-wide level once a year. Uh, so we launched our 2020 NYC staff wellness survey back in late September through the beginning of November. Um, we are currently to date right now. We have our employee feedback survey, which uh, has specific wellness questions as well as crisis response questions active right now. Uh, that's meant to close October 4th with an opportunity to extend for an additional week. Um, in Within those surveys, there are embedded questions, not only matrix questions on a Likert scale that they can answer in terms of awareness of programming, participation in programming, but also the efficacy of the program, but we also have open-ended questions for them to share what are the most successful aspects of programming, what are some of the barriers to those programming, and the like. Um, to be able to share some of the data, if you will, from our previous staff wellness survey, um, in terms of our coordination of food and beverages and donations, 47% of our residents that took the survey uh, say that it was very helpful or extremely helpful. Um, we also took a look at temporary housing and how many people were utilizing that and what uh, the appreciation was for that. 26% uh, said it was extremely helpful, um, as well as wellness events and morale boosting events, 23% stated that it was extremely helpful. In terms of our respite wellness rooms, 23% of residents, and this is just resident-specific data, stated that it was um, very helpful to extremely helpful. And in terms of the proactive uh, unit-based wellness rounds, 33% uh, said it was moderately helpful and 14% said it was was extremely helpful. Um, so we continuously are trying to um, really dive into the experience of the residents and answer the call to action to say, how can we continuously improve for them? In are, terms are those, of utilization of- are, are those visits, are those figures mostly all staff visits? Because uh, you said 23% is extremely helpful, which um, I imagine, even though the number doesn't sound high, I'm trying to imagine that the other you know, 77% is you know i don't know moderately helpful like i guess while the percentage of of what people responded is 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 great and i'm glad that you're bringing numbers i i, I guess i want to know what are people saying to improve on what are you working on to address what is clearly a tragic comprehensive challenge and problem that we are having in taking care of these individuals. Quantitative is fantastic. You need some part of this program to be data driven, but qualitatively speaking, if you're surveying the individuals and you know a quarter of them do find it extremely helpful, what are we doing to get the other 75% to feel like this program is truly in place to help them. Um, I also wanted to ask if you track what percentage of residents completed the surveys, and if you track from the H3 engagements, how many are from residents? So uh, to answer some of your questions, um, the data that I was just providing in terms of the efficacy or satisfaction of the program, that was all resident data. That was not full enterprise-wide data. And it's broken down by uh, not at all helpful, slightly helpful, moderately helpful, very helpful, and extremely helpful. Um, we have so many faceted uh, aspects of the program. So um, qualitatively speaking, each and every single resident that took the survey had an opportunity to share the successes and the, the opportunities for growth or improvement for every single element of our programming. Um, and absolutely, the narrative, the story, the lived experiences of our residents is exactly why we have these program, this programming in place. Um, and we, of course, capture their thoughts. And that is definitely brought in for problem solving and performance improvement and process improvement work for our programming. In terms of utilization of services and how we are trying to get around some of the barriers, if you will, that's where the DIOs, GME directors, the program directors, and chief residents really come into play. Um, that's where we really want to make sure that we have visual management flyers, posters, um, trifold brochures, uh, in services uh, consistently delivered to our resident populations. Um, we know that the barriers often tend to be scheduling conflicts, but that's why we're really looking to embed this in operations within the programming, the residency programming itself, uh, to be during didactic time, uh, protected time for conferences, and the like. 
Um, stigmatization was obviously talked about by Dr. Patel in his testimony. Um, we have done uh, and continuously are trying to uh, really target socialized as well as individualized stigmatization about utilization of services, which are not always just about helping in their sealed debriefs. Again, we have a lot of other services that are not just about emotional support encounters. Um, in terms of the residents' stories themselves, uh, how we utilize them, we took a look at the trends that were coming up uh, qualitatively, not quantitatively, um, to say, okay, what's the trend that's coming up and what are the root causes or the barriers to that and how can we actionably um, approach this. So some of the barriers that came up were um, it, we weren't providing some of these services or they weren't as prevalent uh, on overnight tours or during holidays and weekends. Um, uh, um, a lot of other uh, barriers have really come up that we're really trying to specifically target so that access and equity to support is there for all residents across all tours. Okay, thank. That's very helpful, and I imagine I had, you know, I had a feeling just by nature of um, where a lot of administrative staff is, and you know, a lot of people are there during the day. Clearly, we have overnight uh, workers and 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 people inside these facilities. I can so, add uh, something very quick about the barriers. That one of the barriers that came up when talking to residents is pay. A lot of our residents, you know, when they want to see someone, they don't want to have to worry about insurance and coverage, and that was a major barrier of them finding someone who accepts their insurance so that they don't have to you know, do the out of pocket. And through the concierge service that we established, it takes that problem away. So the resident doesn't have to worry about finding someone in network. We take care of that. All what the resident has to say is, I would like to see someone. And we have pre-screened the providers that we refer to to make sure that they accept the insurance of that specific resident. So I think that that was one of the major barriers that came up as well. And if I might add, just to give another concrete example of how we were listening to the residents. Um, so when we established the, the wellness rooms and the, the standing debriefs, we had heard from the residents, well, I can't get off the floors, obviously, due to patient care demands at that time during the first and second uh, surges of COVID-19. So that's what actually gave birth to our proactive unit-based wellness rounds. We heard from them that they couldn't get off the floor, and we wanted to bring the support to them, including what we called compassion carts stocked with some of the things that were in those wellness rooms, like the protein shakes and, and the bottles of water and the like. So that was us actually listening to our house staff and trying to come up with a solution and an improvement effort. Uh, and again, those proactive unit-based wellness rounds, 33% said it was moderately helpful and 14% said it was extremely helpful. And that's residents. I, I understand and in, in, I'm gonna get to, I think that, um, I think, Protein shakes, water, I think yoga, I think it's a very small component. I appreciate you mentioning it. I think we, I'll get into something a little bit more serious because that those are, those are helpful things, but these are what people are going through in these spaces is so detrimental to their health that they no longer want to live. And I have to just pivot a little bit away. And, I, and again, everyone needs a little bit of help. Of course, groceries are helpful. Being paid what you're worth, your value, that is the bare minimum that we can do. And I realize there are, are changes that we have to make systemically, not just in the city, but across the country on how we value these individuals. So in an article in the city on July 29, 2021, Dr. Wei was quoted saying that helper, helping healers heal immediately deployed to Lincoln in the aftermath of the deaths, sending grief counselors and other mental health aid to staff. But he acknowledged that the program is, and I quote, not meant to address suicide and said that h, h officials are considering whether to change that going forward. Does the H3 program, as it is currently designed, address suicide? If not, why not? Are there any efforts to include this in future programming? And how does h, &H respond when a resident dies? I can say that I think the, the wording is, uh, is interesting because I can understand the quote. I think helping healers here in and of itself doesn't address suicide. However, helping healers here is a layered model, which is 
a three-tier model that definitely would escalate whenever it is needed to mental health services that does address suicide. I think the way I would understand that statement is that the debrief itself is not a clinical encounter and cannot be a clinical encounter for HIPAA reasons, for medical legal reasons, for all kinds of reasons. However, the debrief is designed to immediately go to an advanced debrief and definitely to bring in behavioral services if there's any concern about mental health uh, challenges or suicide. But I wanna let Jeremy talk more about that because he really does oversee the helping either here and he oversees that transition from a debrief to bringing in behavioral health to address any serious issues. So we work together in that sense to address serious uh, scenarios like that. But I'd let Jeremy uh, elaborate more. Absolutely. Uh, and Omar, thank you. I, I think you, you uh, absolutely captured that. So Helping Healer Seal is based off of a three-tier model. The first tier, the foundation of this pyramid, if you will, is having general awareness across all service lines as to what signs and symptoms of compassion fatigue, burnout, trauma, and second victimization are. The second tier on top of that is our trained peer support champions that conduct the debriefs for all staff members. The third tier, which Omar was just referencing, is what we call an expedited internal or external referral network. And so a trained peer support champion, part of the trainings that uh, we go through and that we continuously are improving over time, absolutely speak to signs and symptoms uh, of suicidal risk or harm. However, again, because it is not a clinical intervention, if a staff member vocalizes any thoughts in terms of suicidal or homicidal ideation with a plan, that is when it is immediately escalated to tier three. Um, and or the staff member is uh, supported uh, by our CPEPs or PESs um, or connected to ongoing outpatient treatment depending on the level of risk. So we don't ask uh, trained peer support champions to do any clinical assessments uh, or anything of that nature, but if they start to see signs and symptoms uh, of, of suicidal ideation or homicidal ideation, they are then triggering that tier three response. Okay, so I, I understand the, the tier three response. I just, I'm having a hard time understanding what exactly that is. So, I'll, and I'll just give you an example of something that I read and that our team put together in terms of the American Medical Association provides a toolkit outlining best practices around a response to physician suicide that recommends implementing logistical support for the affected department. So this could include assigning colleagues outside the work unit to provide patient coverage, someone to take care of emails, even silencing pagers during notification meetings and memorial services, for example. Would it be possible to implement this at all h, &H hospitals? Is this, does it sound like something that is incorporated in this tier three response? So the, actually that protocol that you mentioned is definitely something that we follow. It's on the webpage that I mentioned as a guide and we have a link to it and it's actually uh, out there for, for anyone to see because we've had questions about that before and we wanted it to be available in case, God forbid, there's uh, a negative outcome or, you know. However, uh, in the specific case of Lincoln, we definitely did that as you're describing it, and I'll let Jeremy describe more the details, but this is almost exactly what happened. Uh, and I'll let Jeremy elaborate more. Absolutely, so that, that checklist that you just mentioned is absolutely shared with all of our uh, medical and executive leadership uh, if and when there is a death by suicide. We also at central office trigger support. Uh, for instance, when speaking about one of our facilities, Dr. Vital and I actually went to ground and debriefed every single um, resident across all the residency programs, not only personally ourselves, but bringing some of those grief counselors with us as well. I am also a licensed mental health clinician. Um, in addition to that, uh, we wanted to take an individualized approach to this as well. So after the group debriefs across the residency programs did occur, we followed up individually with the residents themselves as well, uh, further um, communicating all of the resources internal and external to our, our system, as sometimes, you know, we don't want uh, our, our residents or fellows to feel um, as though it's a punitive process to attain services. So we're often offering services at 
other H and H facilities outside of their own residency programs or external to our system as well. Okay, so how are residents, in addition to helping healers heal, um, I imagine you have other programs that you've certainly working with. We certainly have very, very talented community-based organizations, nonprofits, experts who can give a lot of time and attention and, and on the ground lived experiences. So with those programs and with helping healers heal, how are residents made aware of these programs? Like I mentioned in my uh, testimony, we, we do recognize, and like you mentioned, Chair Rivera, that the, you know, the schedule and the pattern of their work, it's challenging and we cannot rely on one way of communication. And what we've been doing is really use a variety of techniques so we can capture as many people as possible. So we definitely do direct emails. We do in-person uh, meetings with groups of residents, but we also try to share the information with people who interact with the residents, like DIOs, program directors, CMOs, leaderships at all the hospitals and the facilities so that they're aware of these resources so they can share them with the residents and the house staff. So to answer your question is really in multiple different ways, including emails, including having that information on the main landing page, the main website for NYC Health and Hospitals, we have a direct link to, well, maybe I can take a step back and the step back is that we pulled all these resources and put them together in one place to make it easier for the house staff to find them. So that was step number one. Step number two is we took that one place, which is a one web page, and we try to share it with as many people as possible in as many different ways as possible to make sure that everyone knows about it. And that's something like Jeremy said, we're constantly trying to improve that. By no means, we're saying that we've achieved that. There continues to be a lot of work that needs to be done. And there needs to be a lot of work done on stigma to make sure that people who are aware of the resources to pick up the phone and call. I appreciate that. I, and I wanted to just ask because I know I mentioned interns and residents a lot, but I also know our doctors, our nurses, every single person within a hospital is part of the most important ecosystem. Um, you know, public health is everything. Um, it is, I think, what really determines the well being of the entire city, of our society. And it's certainly how we measure our own success and how we treat each other. So in terms of what was deployed to Lincoln in, in, in the aftermath of the deaths, is the same protocol implemented if there is a suicide of a doctor, for example? Yes, and uh, that's something that, you know, we, we have a very large system and we have so many different programs and so many different divisions. And obviously there is some variations but ultimately that's really the protocol that we follow as a system. And that's like you mentioned, is a protocol that based on the ACGME that's followed by other systems as well. And you know, we've had uh, other suicides happen in sister systems in the past and we've learned from them a lot because they had to deal with the same thing very recently. So we know that this protocol not only comes from a place of, you know, uh, that we trust, but also we know that it has been implemented. We've, we've implemented it in our system and we know that it works. And that is the protocol that we follow. But I wanna ask Jeremy if he has anything else to add to that. I, I think you, you absolutely um, stated all of that correctly. Um, no matter what department or discipline, any death of an employee across NYC Health and Hospitals um, impacts us all. And we wanna make sure that all staff members uh, have an opportunity to express, to mourn, grieve together, but collectively uh, build resilience through these tragedies. Um, so the same protocol does happen. We send emotional support debrief, both triggered at the site level themselves, central office also sends support, uh, and we're in the process of finalizing a distress algorithm, communication and response standard work. Uh, again, why uh, Dr. Patel mentioned variation, because there's different site services, different complements of H3 staff at each of our facilities. Um, we want to create a guideline, if you will, uh, we're also in the process of hiring a crisis response education lead as well, which would be a, a side year PhD that can then also be sent to the site level uh, if and when a tragedy occurs. Yeah, and just to clarify the variation meaning exactly that. So in some places we 
uh, sent support like we did at Lincoln is there was support that came from central office and from other facilities at some facilities uh, they might have enough people at the moment and they might not need as much support but ultimately the workflow is the same the the variation could be in in who exactly is doing it okay so you're in the process of hiring a crisis response education lead you said someone with the phd education in order to uh, do what exactly so the critical response lead would be additional support utilizing their psychological background um, if a site needs additional support in terms of emotional support debriefing, one-on-one uh, -on -one support in terms of, of being able to assess risk at the site level, and just to be an additional uh, workbench, if you will, uh, to support the sites, because we know how hard it can be uh, to cover such large ground while clinical services are in operation. So this will be one hire? Are you going to, is this going to be a team of people? Because there are so many uh, workers inside of your system. I mean, if, if you're getting, you know, thousands and thousands of visits, um, you know, and there's, how are you going to kind of make that role successful? So again, it's an additional support role. Again, we have capacity at the site level. And again, behavioral health services provide support to social workers, psychologists, and psychiatrists on demand at the site level, but this is in addition to, because we don't wanna burn people out when, with wellness if they're trying to continuously uh, support others, we wanna say that we can also support them. Uh, but there is a team at central office. Okay, well, let, let's go to burnout, because I think you know we mentioned one of the big issues is, is pay, of course. There's um, the underpay issue. There's also student debt that a, a lot of these individuals, including doctors and nurses are, are saddled with. But when it comes to time being overworked, if interns and residents or anyone have issues with rotations or with hospital specific policies or scheduling, how do they raise these concerns with their superiors? And are there feedback mechanisms in place that they can utilize? Yes, uh, we definitely have that. And uh, we definitely follow the ACG. I mean, same way we follow the ACG. GME guidelines for if there was a case for suicide, we also follow them when it comes to matters of duty hours. And I'm gonna let my colleague, Dr. Donnie Bell, uh, elaborate more on how we follow that. Good morning, Chair, Chairwoman Rivera, and thank you for the opportunity to testify to the council this morning and good morning to the council members as well. Uh, we certainly have a process for uh, all of our trainees to report any issues they may have with scheduling. Or, or their work and, work and learning environment, which typically goes up through their chief residents, their program coordinators and program directors. They can escalate to their chairs. We also have grad, a graduate uh, medical education committees at our facilities that are composed of residents. And there's also a designated institutional officer at our facilities who are uh, always open to uh, address any questions any feedback on ways that we can improve our programs as uh, that's a continuous process that we, we seek to do every day. Uh, we also have uh, uh, residency platforms that enable us to get feedback and evaluations for both our trainees as well as faculty. Uh, that feedback is anonymized within these platforms to minimize the uh, concerns from our trainees about retaliation. And uh, we, we leverage those platforms as well to uh, garner feedback. So the residency platforms, the, some of the feedback is anonymized, which I understand and I appreciate. Um, is there oversight of, of these processes as, as well as the feedback process? Sure, so, so there's, I guess there's several la layers of oversight. The first again is at the institution level with the Graduate Medical Education Committee. Uh, for, for each institution. Of course, there are, there's also uh, uh, external um, oversight via the ACGME, which does annual surveys of institutions and, some, and programs. Uh, so I think those are the, the two primary uh, levers. 
And it's some of this feedback, um, some of it I've received through my conversations with uh, doctors and residents and, and interns themselves. And just the one thing that they mention are, you know, like wellness days or mental health days to take care of themselves. Um, do is that something that you all offer? Is that something that they can request and, and approve? And I don't mean to get so into uh, the weeds on this, but like if I need a mental health day, it's not necessarily something I think I can schedule in advance. I don't I don't know how I'm going to feel. And, and is it is it simple to to request that? Because uh, we have heard some concerns that um, a mental health day, if you want to call maybe the night before, it, it becomes a sick day. And I know that's uh, getting a little bit into, again, the details of it, but are these things that you offer individuals um, who, who clearly need them? Well, uh, Chairwoman, uh, of course, I, I think, um, you know, wellness days are not going to be something that you can schedule. And so uh, we try to be ex as flexible as we can uh, to, to allot those and to uh, ensure that we have clinical coverage to allow our trainees, residents, fellows to, to be well. And so uh, to that end, we, we do have dedicated wellness days for our trainees. There is some variation there based on the sponsorship of the training program, uh, but we try to make it as easy as possible to utilize those days. And uh, we try to, uh, without compromising uh, the, the, the delivery of patient care to our patients. So the process typically uh, involves the uh, chief residents or the administrators within the programs or the departments. And uh, again, you know, we, we try to remove as much uh, stigma via the efforts that Dr. Fatal has already mentioned uh, and make the logistics and the process of Felicia. phase uh, as easy as possible. I'm on, I'm on the city council WebEx. Sorry about that. Yeah, no worries. It's okay. She was just muted. I think we all appreciate a second for mom. Okay, so 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 thank you. I I appreciate the comment on on feedback. Um, I guess uh, with all of the the programming that you're trying to implement and the evolution of it, and clearly the the improvements that have to be made and and the consideration and feedback that you'll get from these individuals. Um, and we're going to hear from many people, uh, well, some people, some some to be quite frank, some are are afraid to testify. So the people that are here, I have to give a lot of credit to um, for taking this stand and for being upfront. So I guess my last question is, we know there is a stigma with mental health. We know that when we use the word culture, it is about the culture inside the facility, but it is also um, culturally in communities and in, in, in the ethnic communities as well. So how do the various programs take cultural competency and humility into account? And how do they incorporate diversity, equity, and inclusion programming and components? Yeah, definitely. And thank you for bringing this up because that is a major challenge, the stigma part. As far as, for, as, far as cultural competency, in the case of health and hospitals, like I mentioned in my testimony, this is in the fiber of who we are as a system, whether it's for uh, our patients, whether it's for all New Yorkers, and definitely for our own staff and trainees. And that's something that we take extremely seriously. It's in the core core of who we are and in the core of our identity. And to give more specifics in the case of our programming, I'm gonna let uh, Jeremy give some uh, details and talk more about that. Thank you, Omar. Uh, and I just wanna second what you, what you just said. So social and racial equity is the foundational element that drives our mission, vision, and values for our system. Uh, we do have um, a diversity, equity, and inclusion officer and an office within our system that works uh, collaboratively with behavioral health services as well as the Helping Healer Seal Workforce Wellness Programming. So aside from our annual mandatory trainings uh, that all staff members must go through, uh, we're doing some really incredible work 
uh, not only do we have an equity and access council um, to the board, um, we also have uh, uh, representation on our steering committees as well as at our site specific level. What we try to do is to cascade as much information as possible. So some of the just-in-time trainings that I had just mentioned were created collaboratively with the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. Uh, also our Helping Healers Heal and here in New York trainings uh, are pulling in concepts about cultural sensitivity and humility and to build uh, and enhance competency. Um, the most important thing about wellness is that there's representation not only in the clinical space for patient care delivery services, but also in our workforce wellness programming. So we want and need to diversify our peer support champions uh, so that there's choice, if you will, both in race, ethnicity, gender identity, sexual orientation, religion, et cetera. Um, what we tend to do is we create one pagers, infographics, uh, as well as share research and resource links to our peer support champions, our H3 leads, uh, and the steering teams for uh, global dissemination uh, to support our workforce wellness uh, programming as well. And this is something that is, again, of the utmost important to us um, to continuously improve over time. I think you might be on mute, uh, Chairwoman Rivera. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. How do you provide additional support to individuals who are immigrants who uh, speak English as a second language, or, for example, someone who is pregnant? That's I'm a sorry. Follow-up question. I'll go for it, Omar. The, I'm sorry. The last part you mentioned, uh, someone who's. I didn't hear the question. The second part. Someone who is pregnant. Yeah, and I think that uh, for us again, for, for us as a as a system, and I think that you know, in a way, we we you know, and as a immigrant myself and a paramedic graduate, I think it's extremely important to, like you mentioned, highlight the unique attributes of uh, certain populations, but at the same time, make sure that we're integrating them into our services so that we're not necessarily uh, so, so that we're providing our services or that our services are provided in a way that anyone can benefit from them regardless of their background, exactly like our mission says. And that's something that we do for our patients. What does that look like? For example, specifically, we provide interpretive services if needed, for example. But to specifically mention when it comes to uh, our wellness resources, I'm gonna let Jeremy add more details on how does that translate from how we do this as a culture, as a system to everyone into specifically our wellness activities. Thank you, Omar. Uh, again, it has to be stated that all of our workforce wellness initiatives and programs are equally accessible to all staff members, uh, despite their background. One thing that we do across NYC Health and Hospitals is honor and respect diversity. Uh, and what we are in the process of doing, as I mentioned, those wellness events, anytime that we have an opportunity to create an inclusion group to honor or recognize uh, Black History Month, uh, Pride Month, um, uh, any other holiday that, that we believe that any of our workforce members might engage in, we try to create equal spaces at the site level uh, for us to be able to honor, highlight, and respect um, the faith, um, the inclusion, uh, as well as the experiences of our workforce members. All right, I, I, I understand. I think um, just generally, I think culturally, clearly there's, ways that we can, I think, be more inclusive all year round, of course, mm -hmm. of course. I know you know that. I, I appreciate the celebration um, and uplifting Black stories and experiences. Um, but I, I do know that, I, I do feel like some of the issues that we have seen, you know, and, and I know this is systemic and healthcare in this country is systemically racist. It's not created to serve people of color, low-income people, immigrants. So I, I would just, um, I, I thank you for, for your feedback, for uh, your comments overall today. I, I would just, I noticed that the people who are, who have died, who feel historically disenfranchised are the people who are most disproportionately affected even as workers. So I just wanted to, um, I understand this is difficult. It is incredibly difficult in terms of all of your positions and all of the things that you have to fulfill and how you measure that success. Um, 
you know, when you mention a person who might need a, a day off, um, someone who might need coverage, um, and then you mentioned they need to go to their chief resident, I wonder if that would perhaps deter them or even bake in some reluctancy to ask for those days. So I don't quite have the solution for you on how you improve a system that could inherently prevent someone from requesting what they truly need, but that is why um, we're here. And that is why we're really here to also hear from these doctors, these interns and these residents and all of these frontline workers. So I do encourage you to um, stay and listen. Um, and I thank you for your time. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I'm now going to quickly ask if any other council members have questions for this panel. Seeing no hands, um, I'd like to thank this panel for their testimony. We've concluded administration testimony and we will now be turning to public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that um, we will be calling on individuals one by one to testify and each panelist will be given three minutes to speak. For panelists, after I call your name, a member of our staff will unmute you. There may be a few seconds of delay before you are unmuted, and we thank you in advance for your patience. Please wait a brief moment for the sergeant at arms to announce that you may begin before starting your testimony. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom, and I will call on you after the panel has completed their testimony in the order in which you have raised your hands. I would like to now welcome our first panel to testify. Our first panelist will be Tim Johnson. You may begin your testimony when you are ready. Time starts uh, now. Uh, thank you. Um, and uh, uh, thank you, Chair Rivera and other council members for the opportunity to um, present to this uh, committee on this very important topic. I am a senior vice president at the Greater New York Hospital Association. I think everybody on the committee knows that the Greater New York Hospital Association includes um, all the um, hospitals in New York City, uh, both public and private. I will note that h, h is a member of the Greater New York Hospital Association, and the vast majority of our hospitals are teaching hospitals that are committed to training the next generation of physicians. And uh, I really appreciate the fact that this um, um, committee is looking at this issue. This is a very important topic. And I will say that we take um, the issue of um, resident wellness and clinician burnout very seriously. And I just wanna focus my testimony on a couple of key issues. <clears throat> and I want to start with um, how um, the looking at uh, resident wellness issues and resident well-being has really evolved uh, both nationally and within um, the city and our own membership. <clears throat> uh, Chair Rivera, you talked about the limitations on resident work hours, which I think we all know have been in place for 20, 30 years. And this is really um, an outgrowth of a recognition that uh, limitations on resident work hours were important and our members are supportive of those limitations. However, they're not enough. And to really look at um, the issues of resident well being, we need to go beyond just looking at work hours and really uh, look at some of the um, issues that might um, get in the way of residents really being able to have uh, do well within their clinical learning environment. Um, I think Jeremy or um, others talked about the uh, ACGME process. The nationally, they have been the Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education has really looked to uh, uh, update their standards for really making sure that residency programs and teaching hospitals really focus on this issue, and that has been welcomed by the GME community. And I will say, within our own membership in New York City. The uh, graduate medical education leadership have been very supportive of uh, the, the ACGME really looking at this and really uh, paying <clears throat> special attention to it. I appreciate, uh, Chair Rivera, you um, um, making mention of the fact that Greater New York Hospital Association, we did 
create a clinician well-being advisory group uh, within the last couple of years, and we've been looking at many issues relating to. Time expired. Oh, oh um, I just want to say that uh, I'll just finish by saying that uh, um, I really appreciate the fact that H and H is an active member of that group, and Jeremy is a very terrific member, and he brings a lot to um, the other members, the voluntary hospitals. And we really appreciate um, all the work that H and H is doing to really be a leader in this space and really helping the other hospitals in the city really learn from their terrific experience. I'll stop there, Chair Rivera. Well, thank you so much for being here. Um, and I know that you testified at the hearing that I mentioned in uh, June 2020, and you talked a little bit about the Clinician Wellbeing Advisory Group, which focuses exclusively on the issues faced by frontline providers. So can you describe what this advisory group does and how it works with hospitals to address issues faced by interns, residents, and, and other workers inside the systems? Uh, happy to. Um, thank you. And uh, uh, yes, Greater New York Hospital Association, we did uh, testify. My colleague, Jenna Mandel Ricci, who really um, chairs that group, uh, was the person that testified. And what we've been doing with that group is really bringing the hospitals together to focus on uh, learning from each other, uh, how they're dealing with um, and how they're uh, putting some hospital programming in place to really address um, issues across the board, like the um, Helping Healers um, Heal program and uh, wellness committees and how they operationalize those um, programs. And also we've had um, uh, people come in as experts in certain um, uh, the field. Uh, I'm sorry to say that we, we actually, uh, I'm sorry to say that we actually uh, identified somebody that is specializes in physician suicide. I didn't even realize beforehand that there was a, somebody who specialized in this and it's unfortunate commentary that there is such a person out there. But we had this person come in and really talk to our members of the committee and others about how to look for signs of, um, you know, um, a physician depression, burnout, et cetera, and how to really make sure that, um, you know, things are being addressed preemptively and to ensure that uh, signs are being seen and whatnot. And uh, so programming like that and other programs, we really have the hospitals learn from each other on uh, how these, um, how to address a lot of these issues. Well, you also testified last summer about partnering with the American Medical Association to offer um, New York City hospitals the AMA's COVID-19 coping survey, which would assess concepts of stress, anxiety, and burnout. And this was done in an effort to better understand the impact of COVID-19 response on hospitals, workforces, and to inform future interventions. So what was learned from the survey and what did it reveal? And how are the survey responses being used to inform future interventions? Uh, I don't have um, information um, on the uh, survey responses immediately available, Chair Rivera. I'm happy to get that and I will supply that to you and the other committee members. Um, um, as soon as I can. Also it included in the testimony last summer was launching the HERO NY program, the Healing Education Resilience and Opportunity for New York's Frontline Workforce Program. It was a five-part online series uh, that adapts military expertise in addressing trauma, stress, resilience, and wellness for a civilian audience to support the mental health and well-being of frontline workers affected by the pandemic. How was the program received by hospital staff? Oh, hospital staff received that program very well. And, uh, you know, so much of what we were dealing with during the COVID um, and continue to deal with during the COVID um, situation and the surge is very um, similar to what the military go through these very incredibly stressful situations. And we were happy to bring that um, to the hospital members. And uh, I think really, it really shed a light on how to think about this situation that we're dealing with right now in a very different way. And uh, by really looking at how the military has 
dealt with a lot of these issues dealing with trauma and whatnot. And I will say that some of these um, concerns that are out there about uh, trauma, we're particularly concerned about the effect that it has on residents, and which is why as part of that clinical advisory group, we've actually focused a lot on the residents and seeing about doing special programming for them to deal with some of the issues that you mentioned earlier, having to do with stigma and not being concerned about uh, not coming forward and whatnot. And we've got some strategies that uh, we're looking to launch very soon about how to address that for them also. Uh, so aside from some of those, from the programs aimed to address resident mental health, what other supports or programs uh, does Greater New York have in place specifically focused on resident wellness and or residency programs in general? For example, and specifically, do hospitals discuss uh, how to structure, restructure, change, improve their residency programs? Do hospitals seek information about how to run their residency programs and how much of that information that you do seek, how to best run their programs come from the actual frontline workers themselves. Absolutely, and uh, I think Dr. Bell uh, commented on this earlier, the role of the GME committee. Um, every hospital has a graduate medical, edu graduate medical education committee and included within that committee are residents and the leadership of the um, the uh, GME committees and the hospital leadership are always looking for input from residents on concerns that they have about the structure of the program and concerns about the scheduling and whatnot to ensure that they have the best possible experience um, and they don't feel um, stressed out more than uh, um, more than they do um, to really make it a, a good, good learning experience for them. And I will say that's also the focus of, again, the ACGME is really looking at the clinical learning environment to ensure that what's going on in the hospitals for the residents is really a learning environment for them. There is an element of patient care here, but uh, of course, and that's how they learn, but this is supposed to be a learning environment and our hospitals are very cognizant to make sure that that is the case. And again, I would uh, just say that H&H &H has been a real leader for us um, with the Helping Healers Heal and other programs to really help uh, the voluntary hospitals really learn from their uh, great work that they've put into place. Thank you. And, and just one last question, because I have doctors here who have been waiting to testify, and I, and I am very much looking forward to hearing from them. Uh, do you think oversight by the ACGME should be more regular, meaning should they do site visits more frequently? Do residents think the oversight is enough? Um, I think that the, um, you know, the ACGME has, has worked very hard to put a survey process in place that, uh, that works directly with the residents themselves that's confidential. So the surveys are administered and required to be administered by the hospitals, but the ACGME gets that information directly from the residents in a confidential manner. And any concerns that are brought to the ACGME about their experience, the program, um, the hospital, et cetera, is shared with the um, hospital themselves. And um, I think that if it's something that, uh, is concerning to those that collect that information. And I will say the people at the hospital, uh, there's an intervention that's there. And I think there, there are um, numerous mechanisms that have been put in place. It's not enough, clearly. And we always want residents to feel comfortable bringing more concerns to leadership at the hospital or the ACGME. But I think the fact that it's confidential and anonymous is really a very important mechanism that's in place and very helpful. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I didn't mean to, to speak in acronyms, uh, but I, I do think that that oversight is important. I, I, I just my I think our overall concern is we just want to make sure 
that the mechanisms and policies that are in place for trainees, for everyone to give feedback um, is not solely performative, right? And I think you've kind of dived in, dove into a little bit about what you could do. Um, I think the oversight is important because we have to make sure that hospitals are incentivized to make change. And residents sometimes feel like they don't have a way to truly give feedback or they don't have a way out that they can't quit. They, they can't stop what they're doing. So I just want to thank you for uh, your testimony. I wanna thank you for your, um, the information that you provided. I realize there is a lot more work to do. I, and I encourage you as well to please stay and listen to the professionals who will be joining us and sharing very, very honest and open testimony about what, you know, the challenges and what we can change. So thank, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair Rivera. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome our next panel to testify. Um, in order, I will be calling on Dr. Aluyemi Amotoso, followed by Dr. Olga Kobolva, followed by Dr. Yannick Kofi Ralph have... Jones, followed by Dr. Zaydu Benedega. Um, Dr. Oloyemi Omotosa, you may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Thank you. My name is uh, Dr. Oluyemi Omotosho, I go by Yemi. I'm an emergency medicine resident at Lincoln Hospital and uh, the current National Secretary Treasurer of the Committee of Intents and Residents. First, I would like to sincerely thank this committee for holding this hearing on the wellness of the city residents physicians. Interns, residents, and fellows make up a vital part of our healthcare system and are on the front lines, often being some of the very first people that patients see when seeking care at hospitals. However, with the recent spate of deaths of residents at New York City hospitals this year, it's clear that this vital part of our healthcare workforce is facing an ongoing crisis that has only worsened with, but existed long before COVID. This is breaking down our doctors and affecting the care that our, our communities are able to receive. Resident physicians and medical school graduates who have entered into a residency training program. They deliver care under the supervision of attending physicians while further expanding their knowledge and training in their chosen specialty. As they used to reside in hospitals, they are often referred to as house staff. Residents are matched into programs in an algorithm algorithmic process, but because there's congressionally imposed cap, there are not enough residency slots for all the applicants. The 28, there are 2,800 house staff in New York City Health and Hospitals, and they're all proud to serve our city most vulnerable communities and do everything in our power to provide the quality of care that these patients deserve. However, residency is an extremely difficult time with brutal working conditions that are disrespectful, dangerous and unfair. And they disregard evidence on the resulting bad outcomes in both patients and residents. As a result, residents are at facing a crisis of poor well-being, burnout, and suicide. About 50% of resident physicians develop burnout during training and 25% develop clinical depression, a rate that is three to four times higher than other workers. Suicide is the leading cause of death for male residents and the second leading cause of death for female residents as we've heard today various times. Major drivers of burnout and stress have been identified as long work hours, out of title work, and bullying exacerbated by student debt and lack of mental health services. These issues are significantly worse at institutions plagued with chronic understaffing and under resourcing like the New York City Health and Hospital System. Attempts made to address resident well-being have historically placed the onus on us at the individual level and charged residents themselves with building resilience to cope with stress and burnout instead of fundamentally addressing what produced those feelings in the um, first place. I have um, some other Lincoln resident stories to tell and I can just share it quickly if time permits, but otherwise I can come back to it. It, it, is it all right if I call you Dr. Yemi? Is that okay? Yemi is perfect. That's what everyone calls me. Okay. 
Um, if you if you can go, you know, speak a little bit to kind of maybe there's one particular thing you wanted to highlight in your testimony, and I would just also ask the question: um, How can residency programs better support the mental health of residents and interns? Can I, I'm just going to read what my uh, one of my co-residents put put Chloe just to answer that question. Okay. Uh, and, and she said she said um, I have raised my voice at patients because they are taking too long to answer, and all I can think of is the to do list I have: medications to give patients, transporting patients to to imaging, drawing labs of patients, the notes I have to put, I have to write, these charges I have to print out finding the patient a taxi to go home and so forth. This is not me. I don't like shouting on patients, but my hospital is changing me because of how exhausted I am. I wanna be an amazing doctor. I came, I came here to become, but I am overworked, oversaturated, and I'm not becoming who I want to be. That is just her own, uh, what she just said in her anonymous letter uh, to, to the council. Basically residents are being overworked, exhausted and they see themselves just you know not being empathetic the way they thought they're going to be they do a lot of out of title work that at the end of the day takes them away from actual patient care and basically they have to take a step back sometimes and realize that look it's not the patient's fault it's not my fault it's just the conditions i'm working in and this is clearly what leads to resident burnout and you know affects wellness. Thank you very much. I, I do believe that leading with empathy is probably the most important thing an individual can do. And it's hard to when you feel physically, mentally broken in many respects. So please tell your colleague, I want her to be the most amazing doctor too. So we are going to try our best to, you know, hold our systems accountable and, and, and really try to work on improving um, what sound like really terrible conditions. So thank you for your testimony. I just thank you, uh, Councilwoman Rivera, for convening this hearing. Um, I, I'm just proud of the many members of Sierra and, and the alumni who have sent their personal stories. There's so much, and I, I hope you can get to receive these stories. And if I can just say one, one last thing. First, the issues me and my colleagues face at Lincoln are not unique in my own hospital at Lincoln Hospital, residents across the H&H &H programs all experience the same challenges. And it's actually time to address it, like you've said, as a hospital system. And I know HHC can, can actually do it. Secondly, the overwhelming majority of residents wanted to be anonymous out of credible fear of retaliation. Residents shouldn't be afraid to speak about their work conditions and their health and well-being. If you Google Reddit right now, you can see some numerous stories about this where residents are actually afraid to speak up. Uh, we must address this culture that perpetrates this. And finally, when asked what affects their well-being, our members took the opportunity to, yes, advocate for themselves, but mostly for their patients. They would rather spend hours doing all the things we've mentioned just to make sure their patients get the optimal care. So we receive story after story pleading for change, but overwhelmingly, not for us, but for the sake of our patients. Thank you. So Thank you for your testimony. I'd like to just remind everyone that you are welcome to submit written testimony if you're unable to testify today at um, testimony at council.nyc.gov and you are welcome to submit it anonymous, anonymously as well. Um, I'd like to now welcome Dr. Olga Kabolva to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Hello, everyone. I'm Olga Kablova, a third year psychiatry resident at Harlem Hospital. I spoke with multiple residents in my department asking what the, uh, they think is essential for their well being. Let me briefly summarize uh, my thoughts and uh, their thoughts. We all strive for happiness, uh, which uh, can only uh, be possible when seven spheres of life uh, are balanced. They are self development, career and finances, human relations environment, house atmosphere, health and sports, recreation and entertainment, and spiritual development. In residency, life is centered around uh, career and educational development with an inevitable component of human relations. Speaking of financial life, it is lurking in expectancy of future gain, 
but in the present, we are in the mode of survival. Educational development gets compromised by almost unlimited job responsibilities. Human relations is the sphere where disconnect often happens. Residents are in a vulnerable position to speak up if they get unfairly treated by the attendants because the risk of loss of their career is great. Often there is not enough time and resources for team building, so residents don't, don't get support from their peers. Also time commitment of three to four years without flexibility of changing the residency program if things become too stressful creates the situation of learned uh, uh, helplessness, hopelessness. Concerning the other four areas of life, they're usually neglected uh, in the favor of the first three. I want to bring your attention to our essential need uh, to have filtered water in every station where residents work. Uh, so to summarize, residents need more balance in their life, more support from peers and attendants. Here we are asking to promote team building activities, which require financial support. Attendants need to be committed to supporting residents. We need uh, what seem like small changes, like access to drinking water uh, at residence station, so we can stay hydrated, maintain the basics of our physical health. And we need big structural changes, like a decrease in non-physician work and protections for speaking up. We need HNA system um, to adopt a system-wide approach to improving residency. And we need leg legislators at all levels of government to support us in every way you can. Uh, if we act to improve the well-being of the residents, uh, we will be uh, also uh, improving well-being of patients and our community. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Dr. Yane Kofi Ralph Jones to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Hi, good day. I um, hope everyone is having a great day. My name is Yannick Jones. I am an FMG. And I'm here to give a short testimony on the things that can affect um, residents um, currently. I'm an internal medicine resident at Harlem Hospital, and I'd like to use this testimony to discuss several challenges that each and each residents face. Um, this includes also similar work hours and intense level of financial strain, um, along with some of the specific difficulties facing residents who are foreign medical graduates. Dr. Yemi, for example, hit the need on the head for many issues that I'll discuss now. Um, in leading up to this hearing, uh, my colleagues and, and I heard from residents across um, h, h who regularly work 80 plus hours. And these include some 80, 18 hour days. Um, they're saddled with so, many, so much work that they can barely find time to eat or use the bathroom. And they're constantly, consistently exhausted and sleep deprived at their job. Um, at Lincoln, for example, we heard from a resident who said that he's working 24 hours consistently without having um, 15 minutes to even have a bite to eat. Uh, while there are limits on the number of um, hours residents can technically work, the reality is that we are forced to do work outside of what are outside of what we are officially logging, like Dr. Yemi um, discussed, um, lab draws, um, transporting patients, um, discussing transport, for example. Um, another anonymous resident also told us that um, although we are all humans, we, we need our rest to be able to function. Um, he says good night and good morning to the same person because he's working constantly 24 hours without being able to sleep. Um, this happens particularly with the third year residents at my hospital, but it, it will also the first and second year residents experience this also. Um, for those who are familiar with residency, uh, we hear about long hours that are not unique to um, h and H residents. As residents, we get both Saturday and Sunday off. This is called what we call a golden weekend, uh, which is coveted and rare. For example, personally with me, I've only had one of these weekends where I get both Saturday and Sunday off. Um, since I've started, and that's three months now, with only one full week in all. Um, in response to this, we were told that the ACMG rules are too often, uh, uh, we have to abide to the ACMG rules, which is 80 plus hours per week. Um, just because we have to make residents work for so long, we shouldn't have to continue doing so. Change needs to happen. Um, addition to the stress and the fact relative to the number of hours we work, a lot of us experience medical debt. And residents are grossly on the paid, like we discussed before. Uh, for example, we have a resident who is a US resident at Harlem Hospital. Um, she said her car is towed and she's ticketed way too many times because there's not enough space um, for garages and for her to budget 
to pay for garages. Um, for example, she said she had her cable and internet shut off and she was in danger of losing her um, electricity. Um, HMH residents have reported the ability to pay basic necessities, like their own prescription medication and sometimes even food. An anonymous BLP resident told us that his budget for the Time. first year was very tight. More than half of his monthly salary was going to pay him for his rent. And even though he lived in a subsidized housing uh, for most of the year, he would buy, he would have to ration food like dumplings um, in Chinatown. And this would cause him intense anxiety when he had to pay rent. Um, in conclusion, uh, we believe that it's obvious that fostering hospital environment where the doctors on the front lines are seriously on the work and worried about paying rent, for example, and where these are doctors serving the communities uh, that need the most health care, this will suffer. We will suffer and the society will suffer. Um, thankfully, um, it is in the HNH powers to correct many of the difficulties mentioned um, to start. The administration must reform our working hours, they must increase resident salaries, and they must provide housing assistance. Um, it's difficult to live in New York, as anyone knows, and we shouldn't have to be rationing food, for example. In doing this, residents will be able to better focus on assigned tasks, duties, and medical education. And this will help to improve quality of care for our patients. Thank you um, for allowing me to speak and give my testimonial. Thank you so much for your testimony. Next, I'd like to call on Dr. Zaidu Benedega. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Good morning. My name is Dr. Zadio Bendega, and I'm an infectious disease fellow at Harlem Hospital. This morning, I want to talk to you about the struggles I faced as an international medical graduate and that many others face. When I got into fellowship at Harlem, I was happy, but studying residency was quite stressful. Even though I'm American, I, my family's in Nigeria. So when I moved here, I was alone. When I moved back here, I was alone, and I had to pay an exorbitant amount of money to rent an Airbnb for a month. This I was only able to do because prior to to this, I'd lived in the UK for four years, so I had to use my savings. When I applied for an apartment to stay, the landlord's requirement was that my income be four times the rent, as I'm sure most of you know. Uh, even though I'm a fellow, I'm being paid a year one resident salary. It's a different story. So this was quite steep for me. Uh, and this is what most PGY1s do go through. Because I wasn't making four times the salary, I was asked to bring a guarantor. But the thing is, the guarantor had to make at least eight times the rent. And please remember, I have no family in the country. So I had to ask um, my best friend, because that was my only option, to be this guarantor. And this was extremely uncomfortable because I had to ask for her tax, re her tax returns, her personal documents, which is very invasive. And I was really uncomfortable. She wanted to help me, but her husband didn't want her to be my guarantor. So I was putting a strain on that marriage. I was putting a strain on our friendship. Luckily, I did find an apartment in the end, uh, which would rent to me because of my job, but I never should have had to go through this. My hospital and h, &H should have provided support to me to find an apartment when I moved here. With my income, I'm still struggling to, to pay the rent because it's more than my paycheck. As I think Yannick said, it's more than half my paycheck. So I'm really struggling on less than, on living than less than um, a paycheck. Uh, h, h has many residents who are international medical graduates and foreign medical graduates. We work hard to provide excellent care to our patients. It is not a secret that it's harder for us to secure housing when we start our residency. The least uh, h, h can do is provide us the support we need to secure housing so we don't have to beg friends to be our guarantors or sleep on people's couches. Uh, I just want to note that item several of items item seven of our contracts states that we do get housing support this was not the case at all because i was told that this was in a contract that was written in the 90s which isn't acceptable thank you very much for listening to my testimony thank you so much for your testimony i'd like to now welcome dr maham rahman to testify you may begin when you are ready time starts now Dr. Rahman, are you on? I believe he's in attendees. Okay, I think we're maybe having some technical difficulties, so we will circle back to you. Um, I'd like to thank this panel for their testimony and I'll turn it to Chair Rivera for any questions and comments. I just, I guess just generally in, in terms of the 
after what happened at Lincoln Hospital, um, your experience and the the system's response to those deaths, um, if anyone just wants to add any feedback or any insight into that, I, I would I would appreciate it. I think uh, Yemi wants to add something. Okay, can you hear me? Oh, perfect. I was trying to unmute myself, but I couldn't. Um, so thank you for um, for that. Uh, I know the Dr. Omar and Jeremy uh, mentioned something about following the um, ACGME uh, clinic, clinician suicide toolkit. Um, I, I do want to acknowledge that uh, they they did um, to an extent, but just from memory, I recall that after uh, the first, um, one of our first colleagues uh, died by suicide in uh, August 2020. Um, I recall it was a shock to everybody, not just within the internal medicine department, uh, but outside of the internal medicine department. And while I appreciate the ideas that have been proposed today by the um, H3 and the Helping Healing's Healing team, but sometimes it doesn't necessarily translate to reality and you forget that people outside of the internal medicine department are actually being um, in shock. So all the departments are in shock. So all the things that were done were not necessarily carried out for all the departments. Like there was a meeting with the residents of the internal medicine department, but you have, you have seven different programs and two fellowships in Lincoln. None of them really had that same thing that they had as well. Um, we had another resident uh, die by suicide April 2021, and I, I may be 100% wrong, but I do not think uh, a memorial service was heard for that person. Um, and yes, Jeremy did come to Lincoln Hospital. Yes, he, yes, he came, he spoke to residents, and I appreciated everything that he did, but, um, you know, after the first death, and, 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 and I may be wrong, but if it happened in the second and third, but I remember very vividly after um, Adija died by suicide, the internal medicine residents had a meeting, they spoke to them, they, they, they offered um, mental health services, they did everything, but they still went back to work, you know? And some of them were asking my, my attendants, like, how am I gonna go back to work? I'm in shock right now. And I, I really don't know what happened in the second and third case, uh, I'll be honest with you, I, I cannot remember. Um, but it, it, it just, to, just to reiterate again, I'm a chief resident of my, of my, of my department right now. So I, 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 all the things that have been talked about are do happening, but sometimes it just doesn't translate to reality because if it's just one program, there are other programs as well that are actually affected and that whole um, thing doesn't necessarily carry over to them as well. So um, while the things are happening, there's still a lot more work to be done. If I, and I hope that answers your question. It does, thank you. And I know we have individuals here who are listening and taking this feedback. So, so thank you all for your testimony. Thank you very, very much. Thank you all for your testimony. Um, I'd like to now welcome our next panel to testify. Um, we'd like to circle back for um, Dr. Maham Rahman. You may begin your testimony when you're ready. Time starts now. Okay. So my name is Dr. I'm, my name is Maham. I'm one of the medicine residents. I'm in third year now. Um, I'm in third year now. Uh, I'm a former American graduate. I came here as an immigrant to California, and then I, I struggled to do my board exams, but luckily I have 
my family who supported me throughout the residency and then I did some observation and I was financially dependent on my family. I got many interviews and I got matched at Amherst, but at the time I started my residency, I was four months pregnant. I struggled to find an apartment. I I couldn't even walk from one place to another place to find an apartment for a place to live. My dad was with me, but I had no credit credit history as I was dependent on family never felt before. My husband was applying for Pakistan uh, from Bronx, so he got a pre-match and he also moved here. He commuted every day to where was I was pregnant. He found her apartment finally, and I had to I had to show the eleven thousand dollar account that I got from my brothers uh, to just show that I have enough rent to pay, and then I I just owed them those amount. When I started job, I'll just get that back. But being pregnant and being five financially this difficulty and then my husband came and um and it was very hard my schedule during the residency was very hard there was no awareness, awareness of her uh, of wellness i had no obgyn appointment till my my insurance was active uh, and when, uh, when it was finally active i was six months pregnant i had no check up for like my OB follow-up for like months between the time I migrated from Pakistan and between the time I was in New York. So uh, finally, because of all that, I went into premature premature membrane and I had to stay in the hospital for two weeks. And then my baby stays for a month in the queue. Uh, finally, we got home. I had a C-section. I had no I had no insurance at that time. I wanted to take time off because I had C-section. I cannot, I could not do work normally as people could for like four weeks at least. But my my program director gave me um, a, a, an after break. I couldn't take time off because it would also affect my insurance and my baby was using my insurance for like to care to get care at Mount Sinai. And nobody knows how to apply for short-term disability. Um, and then, and then after that, COVID hit, and I had to work a lot, and I went into I suffered depression because of after that I couldn't do anything. Sorry, my second year, I couldn't get anything, and and the, to the point that I was having an episode of derealization stuff. I just um, and then I I I, I searched for psychiatrists like because I am not a person that I'm I am now. I was not a person like that. I was a very bright student all of my medical life. I, I'm a type of person who read medical books since I was a, I was second school student. And then I also affected my family life. Time expired. Medical life. So um, with the challenges that did I have during discrimination kills, make up support kills, because I didn't have my family. My family was back in, in California, burnout kills. For the last one was like having a weekend off and sitting with my family for weekends. And that helps, I think at having financial security. Thank you so much for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome um, Dr. Kaushal Kambati to testify. After, um, we will be calling on Dr. Michael Zingman, followed by Dr. Lindsay Juarez. Dr. Kaushal Kambati, you may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. And uh, thank you, Councilwoman Rivera, for having us and taking the time to listen to us. We appreciate it. Uh, I'm Dr. Koshal Kambadi. I'm a senior emergency medicine resident over at Jacoby Medical Center and a member leader of my union, the Committee of Interns and Residents. Um, working in one of the hardest hit hospitals during the pandemic for the last year and a half was nothing short of harrowing for both me and every single car resident I worked with. Um, to say the least, I think we've been through a complex and nuanced set of emotions. Uh, that said, I started residency in 2018, which is well before the pandemic ever began. Uh, and the crisis of residents being forced to spend hours uh, performing non-physician duties and the culture of not feeling truly supported has sort of been hallmarks of residency at h and &H long before COVID ever kind of came on the scene. Um, Sure, but over the last year and a half, you know, it was terrifying to code people, pronounce them, uh, have difficult conversations with their family members in the same place where COVID was running rampant. Rampant. Um, you know, we received emails of reassurance from some of our administrators, uh, simple things like if you need help, get it or reach out if you need help. Um, but the truth is, most residents don't really feel comfortable doing that. We don't know if our jobs will be at stake if we do that. 
Um, so it's not necessarily the easiest thing for someone to come out and say, I feel depressed or I feel anxious. We don't have the reinsurance, reassurances we need for those things to even take place. Um, you know, we were offered dimly lit rooms. We were offered wellness events with snacks, a hotline or an email, but it's not, there was nothing infrastructural to say, this is how we're going to get you better and how we're going to get you working. Um, that said, the last year was, like I said, harrowing. We do a lot of non-physician uh, focused tasks. I think the most important thing that I can sort of impart is that, you know, none of us really complain about doing the work. I think the reason we do it is because we understand that our patients need it. And that's the thing that'll get them the things that they need the quickest. Um, you know, believing that the hospital, despite all of your work and dedication, doesn't sort of like care about your well-being and allowing you to do your job the most efficient is really what weighs on us. Um, you know, we've been publicly hailed as heroes uh, for our work, but on the other hand, sort of our administration makes us fight for PPE, makes us continue to do things like transport patients to radiology or draw our own bloods, or we're, we're grossly understaffed. And those are the things that need to fix for us to feel better. Um, so CIR asked our members about what they wanted you to know about what impacts their well-being overwhelmingly. And uh, many people from across our hospitals, you know, shared stories. So I know I'm a little short on time, but I'm going to try to share as many of these as I can because they're important. Uh, Dr. Shane Solger from Kings County Hospital. Uh, in the main ED, my routine duties, in addition to seeing patients, documenting the encounter, and creating a treatment plan might involve phlebotomy, IV placements, starting fluids, getting sandwiches, getting blankets, coordinating with family members to pick up their loved ones, and filling out discharge forms. The alternative would be to wait for a phlebotomist or a nurse to get around to the task, which may, also, which may occur one to two hours later, which pushes discharges further and further away from the moment the patient entered the ED. It's a no-win situation. Dr. Sarah Leventer from Kings County, many of our patients' health issues are in inextricably linked with the socioeconomic context of their lives. As a resident, I care about helping my patients, and so I end up doing the work that should be done by a social worker, case manager, or patient navigator. Creating more of these positions in the hospitals would increase the volume of patients that residents could care for by decreasing the amount of extra work residents are doing for each patient. For example, in order to get a breast pump for a new mother, I had to call her insurance company three separate times. I also spoke with the patient twice regarding the issue. These phone calls could have made, been made by a social worker, and I would have been able to see more patients during that time. All right, and then one last one, if you'll humor me, I know I'm over. Uh, from a resident at Jacoby, every single sheet changed, bed cleaned, room turned over is one less patient I get to see and one less patient I get to help medically. I have transported my own patients to radiology an innumerable number of times. With all that time, who's to say how many patients I could have seen and helped with my full medical training? I want the best care for my patients. And for this to happen, we need to be supported as residents. So no more single CT scanner for an entire ED. No more one tech for 30 patients. No more two nurses for 30 patients. This is not safe and it can't be tolerated. And frankly, New Yorkers just deserve better. Um, those are the three stories I had. Uh, I think they pretty much resonate with, I think, what a lot of us feel is that we could do so much better for our patients if we had the support we needed from our hospitals. Thanks. Thank you so much for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Dr. Michael Zingman to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Time starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Michael Zingman. I'm a PGY2 in psychiatry at Bellevue and NYU as well as a CIR New York Regional Vice President. In just over a year working as a resident physician at Bellevue Hospital, I have continually felt powerless. My residency started amidst the COVID-19 pandemic and I have not experienced life as a resident in which many of my colleagues are not burned out, exhausted from caring for COVID patients or angered by being put on the front lines without proper safety protections or hazard pay. As a resident on a split payroll with NYU and New York State, I also recently experienced multiple rapid changes to my health insurance and uncertainty about my enrollment, as well as a one month delay in my payment leading to financial strain. When we asked EIR members to share their stories about what impacted their health and wellness as a resident at h, &H our members overwhelmingly told us it was the excessive time spent doing non-physician duties. In talking about out of title work, one member told us, it definitely makes me feel disrespected, undervalued, 
and as a tool more than a person or trainee. I feel sometimes the hospital would not work if residents were not constantly made to do these types of things. And because of that, they have become part of what simply is. I spend a significant amount of time doing things unrelated to actual clinical training, but if I didn't do them, not only would they never get done, but I'd also be blamed for it. Another member told us, I entered residency to get a good education and become a well-rounded doctor. I feel the system has greatly underserved me and I'm worried about my own well-being and ability to provide excellent patient care. When our education is neglected by our programs or not respected, it impacts our well-being. It disconnects us from why we became doctors and why we chose our specialties. Many physicians are not adequately trained to understand the dynamics shaping their patients' lives. Few physician training programs with established curricula on health disparities exist. Experiential opportunities in the community served by hospitals are even rarer. When our programs lack this experiential learning aspect, it provides additional stress on residents. The work CIR has done to meet this gap in experiential learning is another example of how our union is stepping up to meet the needs of residents. One fantastic example that I'd like to mention uh, is that Lincoln Hospital, um, through their emergency medicine program, they have a community walking tour organized by CIR leaders for incoming interns to fill a gap in their training. Made possible with union resources, this was an experience meant to educate these new care providers on the history and reality of the community and highlight the advocacy work already being done by community members. CIR's efforts to connect residents with the community is long-standing, as exemplified by the Family Health Challenge, which is a program in which doctors go to local elementary schools to educate students on healthy habits. So far, we have engaged over 750 CIR doctors and over 2,500 New York City school children. These types of initiatives have added much value and a renewed sense of purpose to our members, making them more connected to their communities and improving the care they're able to provide. We need more investment from H&H &H in experiential learning like this. As you can see, I'm incredibly proud of the work my union's doing to meet the needs of residents, but we need H&H &H to be as invested in improving residency as we are. I wanna end by talking about a recent win CIR members have fought hard for at Woodhull Hospital. In October of 2020, residents at Woodhull began to push the hospital to address the excessive out of title work they had been doing and the impact on their ability to complete their physician assigned tasks on time, as well as the resulting duty hour violations and increased workload. It was an eight month long campaign where residents banded together to hold meetings with hospital administrators, collect data, organize petitions and more. These efforts finally paid off when the hospital issued a memo eliminating resident responsibility for phlebotomy and arranged for additional training of ancillary staff to meet these needs. As a result, residents can now focus on learning and providing their patients with holistic care. Though this was a fantastic win, the effort needed to achieve it was immense. It does not serve residents or h, &H to continue to make residents fight program by program and hospital by hospital to address what is a system-wide issue. While we acknowledge the exact solutions to realizing a reduction in blood draws being performed by residents at each hospital may differ, we call upon h, &H to step up and require all, program, all programs issue directives such as the ones from Woodhull to remove these duties from the residents and work with CIR to identify the hospital specific solutions. h, &H can and should take this system-wide approach to out of title work if they truly value and want to support residents and improve our well-being. Truly addressing the crisis of out of title work residents perform will require funding for additional nursing and ancillary staff. This is something the city must commit to providing. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Dr. Lindsay Juarez to testify. After Dr. Juarez, we'll be hearing from Dr. Dina Jaber. Um, Dr. Lindsay Juarez, you may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Uh, good morning. My name is Dr. Lindsay Juarez. I'm a third year anesthesia resident from Metropolitan Hospital. Um, I wanted to talk to you today about how our health and wellness is negatively impacted when some of our very basic needs are routinely not met by our programs and additional financial strains are put on us. Um, as part of our residency program, we do mandatory outside rotations at other sites. 
Uh, one of these is Montefiore Medical Center, where we are to arrive at 5 a.m. and finish around 7 p.m., though that routinely uh, extends to 8 or 9 p.m. at night. Uh, this means we're at the subway at 3.30 in the morning, uh, and issues were raised with our program leadership about safety. In response to these uh, safety concerns that were raised, uh, one of our residents was simply told to take an Uber. Uh, it should be noted that an Uber is 60 to $80 each way to Montefiore. Uh, after more concerns were voiced, uh, both uh, via phone calls, meetings, and emails, we received a written letter from program leadership uh, stating that we were made aware during interviews uh, that we would be rotating to these sites and that it's our own responsibility to get to our rotation on our own on time. Uh, it's not just this issue that affects our well-being, uh, but the consistent act of having to fight, uh, have meeting after meetings and email after email, um, this in itself is really exhausting, uh, especially when it's over the most basic of needs. Uh, another issue that really uh, is impacting us at Metropolitan Hospital, since the end of summer 2020, uh, surgical and anesthesiology residents uh, at my hospital have been plagued by constant interference with their ability to obtain hospital issued scrubs from the scrub machine. Uh, institutional policy requires all, requires all OR staff to wear these scrubs. Uh, at this time, ID badge access to the machine is frequently revoked and scrub credits disappear without any notification. Uh, when someone is unable to obtain scrubs from the machine, the only alternative is to wear disposable paper scrubs. Uh, I don't know if any of you have worn disposable paper scrubs, but they're very uncomfortable. They're bulky, they have loose elastic waist, and they have a high tendency to tear, uh, often just from sitting down. I can't tell you the number of times I've had to wear them and the crotch or the armpit uh, simply tear from moving or sitting down. Uh, it may seem to be a funny picture, but it's definitely not a dignified way to work. Uh, paper scrubs are designed to be worn over one's street clothes and they're made available in the operating room uh, for visitors like medical and surgical device reps or shadowing students uh, who are uh, to wear them over their clothes so they can enter the operating room. Uh, however, they're clearly not uh, appropriate at all for all day use by hospital staff uh, working in such a high acuity environment as the operating room. Over the last 12 uh, months, repeated inquiries have been made to the one single person in charge of scrub access via telephone, email, and personal visits. Uh, and we are repeatedly met with the same response. He says, I'll have to look into it or I'm busy right now. I haven't time had time expired. yet. Uh, he says, you'll have to come back later. Uh, after weeks or months of follow-up, no resolution is ever reached. Uh, struggling to get the absolute basics is not unique to my hospital. And I'm sure that every h, &H resident has at least one example like mine. I'd like to share a statement that Dr. Hoffman from Bellevue shared uh, in regards to ongoing and often failed hunt for sheets to sleep on. He said, it makes me feel like no one cares about the residents, like I don't even belong in this hospital. Uh, forgive me, I know I'm out of time, uh, but I just wanted to bring up these two issues which really are exhausting and demoralizing to us. Um, and they represent kind of the hospital's inability to provide us with the very basics that we need to work. Um, so thank you for listening to my testimony. Thank you so much for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Dr. Dina Jaber to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Dina Jaber. I'm a PGY2 in internal medicine uh, at uh, Kings County Hospital, where I've actually been since I was a third year medical student. I just want to talk about the burden of non-physician duties that we've been carrying as residents at H&H &H, and that it's real and often overwhelming, but it is a product of years of undersourcing and underinvestment. It, it must change. Uh, duties that have been historically vague became the task of physicians, even if it isn't. It's often presented as, quote, oh, well, the docs usually do that, or nurses will say, I have to take care of X, Y, and Z. I'll get to that if I can. And so the physicians will often do tasks and it becomes something that the nurses see us doing consistently and understandably come to think that that is the duty of the resident and not a nurse. I'd like to give you guys an example that I went through at Kings County. I was often told by the nurses that calling live on the organ donation hotline that we call when a patient passes away was a task that I had to do because quote, the physician does it. I didn't know any different. So in addition to pronouncing a patient, calling their family, filling out my paperwork, I was also making sure that I called live on in a timely fashion. One day while working across the street at Downstate, I had a patient pass away and it was my first time doing the process at Downstate. So I went to the nurse asking if he could provide me with the rest of the papers needed for me. He told me he had already completed it and I could focus on the rest of my work. I initially thought he was joking and I was confused because I do it all the time at County. 
So I must have to do it here too. He laughed and he said, no, but also then asked me like, what else do you do at County? Because it seems like you have a lot of extra tests on your hands. I feel like there's a lack of communication on what nurses are trained to do. And not all the nurses are trained to have the same capabilities. It leads to far too much time spent going back and forth, determining what is the task that'd be done by the residents versus the nurses and other ancillary staff. And so it doesn't create a good culture between the nurses and the residents, which is a further stressor for us, for the nurses, and clearly is not good for our patients. Right now, I'm actually rotating at Memorial Sloan Kettering and nurses do blood cultures as it is the same exact process as any other blood draw, but at Kings County, the nurses don't do blood cultures and as they say, quote, are not allowed to. But the reason behind it is vague and means that the doctors now have to come in and do blood draws. So this is extra time that we are spending coming in to do lab work that could have been done at the same time in the morning. This also means that we're now sticking the patients twice. And I'm sure anyone who's gotten their blood draw doesn't want to get stuck twice by needles. It's bad enough we have to stick them once to come in again and say, hey, sorry, the nurse couldn't do this, so I have to do it now, means that we have to stick patients twice. I feel like the nurses and the techs are totally understaffed. One evening I was covering, various patients needed blood draws. However, the nurse was taking, that was taking care of these patients was dealing with an urgent transfusion. So I stepped in, drew blood on four different patients that hour and stayed past my sign up by almost two hours. I'm not the only one that who sees and feels this as another resident from Kings County told us, quote, the nursing, the nursing culture at Kings County is tainted. We have drained and shattered our nurses. The travel nurses will be the first to tell you the same. And as the backbone of the hospital, they are the ones uh, that we, the residents need to interact with to get patients the care that they need and deserve. When any group of workers is stretched too thin, it affects all of us. A resident from Lincoln put it best when he said, when everyone is burned out, overworked and unhappy, it further creates an unhealthy environment for everybody. I'd like to close off with finally saying, I wanna make it clear that it is possible to improve the health and well-being of residents at H&H. &H. Things don't have to stay the way they are and now is the time for that to change. We don't want to be here telling you story after story of how we had to spend 80 hours in the hospital doing non-physician work and that we are exhausted and burnt out. I believe that you can invest in the staff, invest in the nurses, invest in their training, and in turn, you will also be investing in us and our patients. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Um, this concludes testimony for this panel. I'd like to just ask if there are any council member questions at this time. As a reminder, if there are, you may use the Zoom raise hand function. I do want to recognize that we've been joined by council member Eugene. And I want to thank this panel, of course, it, for bringing up experiences and how important it is to visit places and, and do this work intersectionally. And again, uh, to people who are new mothers or pregnant, the work that we have to do for them is incredibly important. So thank you all for, for your testimony. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd like to thank this panel for their testimony. And we'll be now moving on to our next panel. In order, I'll be calling on Dr. Carrie Ann Shelvo, followed by Dr. Leo Einstein, followed by Dr. Hannah Marshall, followed by Dr. Michael Deval, followed by Dr. Prama Alaya Parumal, followed by Dr. I. Michael Lightman. Dr. Carrie Ann Shelvo, you may begin your testimony when you are ready. Time starts now. Uh, good afternoon. Um, thank you for the time today, um, Chairwoman Rivera. I especially want to thank you for convening this hearing and for your advocacy for interns, residents, and fellows like myself. Um, my name is Dr. Carrie Ann Shavoy. I'm an addiction psychiatry fellow at Bellevue Hospital. I knew becoming a doctor would be hard. My mother is a nurse, so from a young age, I knew the toll that comes with working in healthcare, helping people during the hardest moments of their lives. But along with that toll comes the reward of knowing that perfect strangers put their trust in you to be there for them when they're at their most vulnerable. I knew that I wanted to dedicate my profession to earning that trust and studying medicine to live up to that privilege to the best of my ability. I worked hard at a competitive undergrad school and medical school in hopes of realizing this dream. I accrued over $400,000 in student debt, and by the time I started my intern year, I was already starting to feel burned out. As the months went on, I was performing more and more non-physician work. I was only sleeping a few hours a night, 
didn't see my family and friends and was doing much more administrative work than practicing medicine. One day a friend asked me to talk to their younger sibling who wanted to become a doctor and I told them it wasn't a good idea because I had completely forgotten why I spent the last de decade fighting tooth and nail for the privilege to be allowed into this profession. Then toward the end of my intern year, a co-resident in my program died by suicide. I will never know why she ended her life and it would be unfair for me to make any assumptions about the unique pain she was experiencing that led her to that point. Of course, we're left to wonder whether some of these residency experiences that you've heard about today may have contributed. It's hard to talk about suicide. It scares us and none of us, not even myself as a psychiatrist will ever fully understand it. But we know and we have known for a long time that physician suicide is a major issue in our field that goes too often unspoken. As doctors, it can feel like a betrayal to make an assumption about why one of our friends and colleagues ended their own life. However, on a larger systemic scale, here's what we know. Doctors are under enormous pressure to be infallible, to work nonstop, and to make up for the gaping holes in our healthcare system. We also know that doctors are dying too soon from suicide at rates disproportionate to their non-doctor peers. Although I cannot say when my colleague ended her life, what I can say is that it made me and the entire community I, I work in look closely at the effect our residency was having on our lives and our mental health. It made me realize how burnt out I was and scared that others were also suffering in silence. Um, I want to, uh, to speak for a moment as well about the Patient Care Trust Fund, which um, really significantly improved my well being after that time, as well as getting more involved in CIR, um, advocating for changes in my program that were really realized over the next year. Um, the Patient Care Trust Fund is, uh, I'm just going to explain a little bit about what it is. Um, it's a great example about. Uh, how giving power to residents can make real change in our hospitals. Um, it's a grant program um, that provides uh, holiday grants, uh, research funds, and equipment funds um, to residents. And I served uh, as the chair of this fund last year, along with other representatives from health and hospitals. Um, we're all residents who are uh, determining the grant distributions to residents. Um, and if uh, you have some time, I'd like to speak a little bit more about it. Uh, if, if uh, possible. Thank you so much for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Dr. Leo Einstein to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Hello, my name is Leo Eisenstein and I'm a third year internal medicine resident at Bellevue Hospital Center. <clears throat> In our residency, we work both at Bellevue and at the private NYU Langone, just a few blocks away. I can tell you that it is a daily distress toggling between these hospitals, seeing and participating firsthand in our, in our city's segregated healthcare system. <clears throat> I'm proud to train in New York City's public hospital system, which cares predominantly for the city's poor patients and its people of color, as well as the many undocumented patients with only emergency Medicaid or no health insurance at all. Working at Bellevue is why most of us chose this residency. We provide high quality care to patients regardless of ability to pay or documentation status. And we pride ourselves in the possibility that by providing excellent care to historically marginalized groups, we can maybe help a little to chip away at the rightful longstanding distrust of the healthcare system by black people and other people of color. But there is no denying that the experience of training at Bellevue is a constant uphill battle. Because of the profound resource limitations like shortages of nursing and phlebotomy, we as residents have to fight tooth and nail to advance our patient's care. <clears throat> as residents, we draw labs, take vital signs, transport patients, not because the nurses and phlebotomists and PCAs are bad at their jobs. Far from it, they are terrific, but they're stretched thin just like us. Residents are left to try and fill in these holes. We do it to make sure our patients get the quality care they need and have a right to, but we only accomplish that by bending over backwards, staying late. It is exhausting and demoralizing, a recipe for burnout. Meanwhile, just up the street at NYU Langone, our experience as residents could not be more different. Resources abound and the city's wealthy and privately insured patients get expedited, streamlined care. And participating in both of these care environments is a good education in the inequities of our health system, 
but the moral distress of that experience does take its toll on us. For residents of color, the impact is only compounded. As one resident who wished to remain anonymous said when talking about practicing in a segregated healthcare system, quote, seeing this unequal treatment and care contributes to my burnout as a black resident, end quote. This is from an anonymous resident at Jacoby. Quote, I regret to see that understaffing and out of title work here leaves you with no opportunity to learn. And the only thing you bring home every day is the fatigue and sense of burnout. It's sad to see my patients are not satisfied with the care they receive and that their concerns are valid, end quote. So our direct appeal to you is this, allocate more resources to h and ensure safe nursing ratios at h and and more transport and phlebotomy staff. Because when the city government distributes more resources to h and and when h and can adequately staff its hospital, um. this intervention will have a direct appreciable effect on our well-being as residents. It will mean that we can focus on doing our jobs and focus less on plugging the holes of a currently under-resourced system. Finally, the issue we're describing about training at h and isn't just about our wellness as residents now. It also raises recruitment concerns for the city's public hospitals. Residents come specifically to h and hoping to fight systemic racial and economic inequities in healthcare. But if residents here experience burnout from the lack of resources, that represents a very serious risk to recruitment and retention. As residents are inclined to accept jobs elsewhere, further draining talent from our city's public hospitals. h and patients deserve doctors, deserve and need doctors who train here then stay after residency to continue serving these patients. If you want to support resident wellness and retain the h and trainees for their future careers, then h and needs more resources and better staff to patient ratios because mission-driven healthcare should not come with the moral injury we experience regularly at h and Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Dr. Hannah Marshall to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Hi, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for having this panel. My name is Hannah Marshall. I'm a third year OBGYN resident at Kings County Hospital. Um, I'm speaking as a member of CIR. I'm our department uh, representative as well. Um, I wanted to highlight another aspect of how training at public hospitals affects resident wellness and well being. Um, healthcare funding and resource allocation is a big topic to address in complex based uh, systems level, but um, working in a public healthcare system, we as residents have front row seats to how service cuts and lack of resources can be catastrophic for our already vulnerable patient population and have resonating implications for our learning and training and wellness. Um, as residents, we're here to learn, but we all chose to train at these public hospitals. We chose, as uh, Leo said, to train at h and &H because we're committed to and passionate about getting our patients the care that they deserve. It's one of the things I love most about my residency and my co-residents. Um, as a safety net hospital, Kings County is one of the only public hospitals treating women without insurance or who are undocumented in Brooklyn. We serve an 85% black population who's already facing the worst health disparities in New York City. Um, speaking to uh, our personal experience then, in July of 2020, gynecologic oncology services were cut from Kings County Hospital with no real plan in place. Gynecologic oncology is doctors that specialize in treating the cancer of the female reproductive tract. Um, the loss of this service affected us and our patients at every level. Importantly, we worried that this loss could have huge implications for our patients in terms of worsening health disparities and worsening rates of black maternal mortality. For example, a gynoc surgeon is surgical backup for high-risk pregnancies, for fibroids, for placenta accreta. And there's a clear difference between health outcomes for black women and women of any other race. Um, for all cause ovarian cancer mortality rates are 1.3 times higher in black women than white and endometrial and cervical cancer mortality rates are twice as high. Um, limiting access to essential services like surgery, chemotherapy and follow-up simply compounds those baseline disparities. For years, we've been discussing healthcare disparities, and yet we continue allowing changes that disproportionately impact our already vulnerable populations. Um, so how does this affect us as residents and our training and our wellness? Uh, for better or for worse, a huge part of our collective energies has turned to patient advocacy. Um, uh, for that, in many ways, I'm thankful. Uh, with the help of CIR, local community organizations, our patients, and our faculty, we 
circulated a petition, we organized a rally, we've held many meetings with h h leadership over the past year regarding the return of gynecologic oncology service to Brooklyn. And we're happy to report that Kings County is currently interviewing candidates for a new gyne onc position. We genuinely appreciate the efforts that h h leadership has made to bring back the service. But I can say with time, we have spent hours and hours figuring out care coordination, how we consult and follow up these patients instead of reading, studying, or discussing direct patient care. And these out of title measures, these phone calls with the financial office, these are not unique to GYN or the situation. We all know this. We see numerous cases of patients signing out against medical advice from Bellevue, this referral center, an hour and a half away by public transportation, only present the next day at Kings County with the same complaints because we're their home hospital. We are accessible, we're here. Every day, and even more over the past year, we see women in our community mistreatments, forego care entirely, or present with advanced disease due to barriers of care, and we see their outcomes suffer. We see these tragedies and feel like we're part of the system. Should we have advocated more for that patient? Could we have done more for her? Having to deal with that constant fight for more resources for our patients, for better and just care, leads to a moral injury that eventually compounds these feelings of burnout, that we can't do anything more. Moral injury is defined as when we perpetuate, bear witness to, or fail to prevent an act that transgresses our deeply held moral beliefs. Over time, these moral injustices we see add up. Uh, as Leo noted, many h and residents also rotate at private hospitals, and we see how the distribution of resources is so glaringly unequal. Why does my patient here in central Brooklyn deserve anything less? The worst outcomes we see in poor communities and black and brown patients seem almost premeditated as the resource allocation is so starkly unequal. We all chose these programs because we care about our patient population. h and is one of the most innovative public health care systems in the world. We come here with the intention of making the world a better place. But we are constantly fighting for our patients against this avalanche of failure, and it leads to this general disillusionment. It compounds the burnout. It's not just a failure of h and it's a failure of the American healthcare system in general. We fight the system every day tooth and nail to provide for our patients, but often at the expense of our learning and clinical training and at the expense of our mental well-being. In conclusion, the things that improve patient care also improve resident wellness. They are inextricably linked. Treat everyone with respect. Give us the resources for us to do our jobs to the best of our ability. Allocate more funding to health and hospitals. Allocate more funding to health and hospitals. <laughs> prioritize the lives and health of your most marginalized communities. And with that, you will uplift and protect the resident physicians who have dedicated their time to the city. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Dr. Michael Duvall to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Hello, so my name is Dr. Michael Delaya. I'm a fourth year emergency medicine resident and I work at Jacoby Medical Center in the Bronx. I'm also the regional VP of the union uh, in the New York area, the Committee of Interns and Residents. So just to begin, we're not the high powered independent physicians with six digit salaries that the general public thinks we are. Thousands of residents struggle to manage the high cost of living and work and work extreme hours while maintaining the well-being of themselves and their families. Just to get into the numbers, the average base pay of a resident physician in New York City is approximately 63,000 a year. We work 60 to 80 hours per week. Current medical graduates that's just out of medical school starting residency sit at an average debt of $250,000 and we accrue $13,000 in interest every year on average. Add to this the extreme physical and emotional toll of working in our overwhelmed healthcare system during a historic global crisis that was centered right on top of us. And it's pretty easy to understand why New York City residents feel unsupported, unseen, and hopeless. Residents are reluctant, reluctant to take any action that may endanger, endanger their place in their program. When we do find our voices, we are completely dismissed. Um, as one of my colleagues, Dr. Malika Manyapu from Jacoby as well, uh, said, quote, when we speak about issues we face as residents, we are told that back in the day, it was much worse, or you guys have it easier now. Our concerns are perceived as unnecessary complaining. This mentality is pervasive among medicine and promotes the idea that we should not try to improve or change the system. Caring about our ability to provide adequate patient care and its effects on our mental and physical health means we are somehow weaker as physicians." End quote. It is difficult for a resident to access mental health services because licensing bodies and employers look into what mental health treatments a physician has sought. These training environments can even turn abusive. One resident who feared retaliation anonymously shared the following. 
quote, you escalate too much and it'll come back to haunt you. Having an opinion is unprofessional. Advocating for your patients is unprofessional. If you have to confront someone higher than you, it's unprofessional. They tell us we don't do 24 hours, but many of us have actually been told to stay the night shift after a day shift and we complied. And if you bring this up to the program directors, telling them you're exhausted because you just worked 24 hours, they'll say that's impossible. You tell them, well, the chief made me do it. They'll say, no, that didn't happen. I don't know what you're talking about. You tell them you're burnt out. They'll say it's all in your head, end quote. I wish this story was an outlier, but it's not. In the lead up to this hearing, we had countless members re reach out to tell us they were bullied, dismissed, gaslit, and retaliated against for speaking out. There's a reason so many of our testimonies are sent in anonymously. As a union, we have won protections for our members against losing their jobs. We can't stop an attending from withholding a recommendation a resident needs to get into the cutthroat, highly competitive fellowships they need to, or to practice as an attending. We need H&H &H to have system-wide oversight. Union protections are crucial, and one of the main reasons why I feel comfortable speaking to you today, as well as being a senior on my way, but many residents across New York City do not have these protections, and many of them are providing care in uh, non-H&H hospitals. As one resident explained, quote, in my hospital, one in which half of the residents are unionized and the other in which half are not, I get to see what happens when residents decide they should have a say. As an intern, you're stuck with the crappier private hospital contract, and once you become a senior, then you graduate to the better unionized contract. Being on the union contract means you work less hours, get better pay, get more benefits, have an option for sick and parental leave, and ultimately an ability to stand as a united resident front, end quote. When we were in split payroll programs and half the program is non-unionized, it directly affects us. Recent actions in the split NYU Bellevue EM program are a clear example. NYU administrators recently reviewed the EM department, which serves both NYU and Bellevue, and they perceived the program as social justice oriented, which was characterized as a negative quality. Interns are no longer allowed to learn and practice in the Bellevue ED. Interns are being trained in a private healthcare environment that serves a predominantly white, English speaking, socioeconomically advantaged patient population, in contrast to the city hospital system, of which Bellevue is a part and which aims to serve all New Yorkers. Additionally, residents who have already completed their intern year are now covering intern year shifts. This means they're working longer shifts. They're not given the graduated response and they're not given the graduated responsibility that is so essential to learning. As the resident in the flag, the situation explains the fact that admin viewed social justice as an undesirable goal was harmful to resident wellness. Furthermore, reports that faculty members have lost their jobs after speaking up on behalf of residents has created a culture in which residents fear very real retribution. No doctor should fear for their career because they advocated for their patients and their communities. When we struggle, our patients suffer. We are the biggest public health care system in the country, and we have the opportunity to stand as leaders on these issues. We cannot continue to manage medical residency as various compartmentalized institutions. We need a system-wide approach. We're here now. We're asking for help. Please listen. Help us take action. Thank you so much for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Dr. Prama Alaya Parumal to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for hearing from me. Um, listen, my name is Dr. Prama Alaya Parumal. Um, after med school, I did three years of internal medicine residency at Woodhull Hospital. I'm currently doing my fellowship in pulmonary and critical care medicine, which has me rotating through Kings County and Coney Island Hospital. As the speakers before me have said, H&H um, &H hospitals lean very heavily on resident physicians. Um, the system simply would not be able to care for the volume of patients that we care for, uh, at the level of quality approaching the standard of care without the diligence of residents. Yet speaking quite frankly, residents are abused uh, in the course of being asked to perform their duty for patients. And the strain and exploitation that residents are subject to was only exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, on top of existing stress, we were hit with more death than ever seen before in our careers, the upheaval, upheaval of schedules, educational time, uh, vacations, and whatnot. On August 27th, uh, the CIR had um, a resident wellness uh, activity uh, over Zoom, and I spoke face-to-face -face with um, uh, HHC CEO, Dr. Mitchell Katz, and uh, I mentioned that there were conditions within our work environment specifically being um, antagonized, condescended to, berated by hospital administration that was leading to uh, harm and morale. Now, three days after my conversation on August 30th, uh, Dr. Adiraj Satija from India, a Lincoln resident, died by suicide. Ten days later, on September 10th, a resident physician uh, in my class attempted suicide and um, uh, required an eight-day hospital stay 
and this uh, resonance in particular did cite um, the toxic environment at work as a contributing factor and described being yelled at by um, HR staff uh, that very afternoon, uh, the night of the suicide attempt. And the following April, uh, of course, uh, Dr. Walid Saleh Abushmi of Jordan uh, took his life. Uh, even uh, in the face of these tragedies, I don't feel like uh, HHC leadership has taken meaningful action. In their opening remarks, uh, they talked about wellness rooms at Lincoln Hospital. These rooms were actually staffed, run, and financially supported by psychiatry residents themselves. HHC talked about um, the Helping Healers Heal program and peer support groups. The truth is residents are very good at supporting one another. We go through this together. We have such um, impressive uh, cohesiveness, cooperation among residents. The problem is what is being done to us, right? And what we need and what there is no substitute for is improving the working conditions um, and, and for our, us, for our, for our communities, for our patients, uh, to, be, to have us treated with the dignity and respect due a doctor working in a difficult job, right? No amount of chair yoga or protein shakes in the break rooms can make up for the fact that, um, that we, we lack a robust support for these issues. And residents do seek help. They are turned away. They are sometimes punished. The uh, resident who incurred an eight-day hospital stay after a suicide attempt at my program was told that they would have to make up those days or would be graduating late, thus jeopardizing starting a career, starting fellowship, or other things. Another resident on mental health leave, leave at Woodhull sent a message to her colleagues explaining her absence, saying things like, I left work because I was going to jump from a train after a long week of work. I'm expired. And thank you, everybody, for showing your support during this tough time I'm going through. That message was forwarded by um, the chief of medicine at Woodhull to Woodhull leadership, saying, and I quote, this is the kind of instability I was concerned about. But that's the kind of response that people who are put out honest, genuine cries for help uh, get in, in response. A former Bellevue resident says HHC leaves the trainees and staff with the impression that they're indifferent to whether we live or die on the job. And real quick, it's, I think it's important people understand um, the Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education is the governing body of, uh, of residency programs. But what they can do is limited. They can cite a program, uh, they can put a pro program on probation, and they can uh, withdraw accreditation. But those are, are not it. They can't find, they can't force personnel changes. So Woodhull was placed on probationary accreditation in January of this year. And the yearly surveys might uh, might, might make administration uh, try to change some things because if they get bad remote, bad uh, reviews on the surveys, they can lose accreditation. But the residents know that if the hospital loses accreditation, they're out of jobs and they're gonna have a hard time getting a new job. So there's trepidation in honestly reporting whether or not uh, things improved. Um, so in closing, I just wanted to say, this is like a recipe for disaster, right? Um, personally, I've been extremely disappointed with Dr. Katz, the CEO's response to everything that's happened in this past year. I've engaged him multiple times directly through email. HSC is the largest public health system in the nation. We care for so many people from so many communities with pride and compassion under very difficult circumstances. So if I've moved any of you today, um, I urge the members of the city council and the mayor's office to take up to the cause of improving things for resident positions within the HHC system, because I believe only strong external pressures from your offices could do so. Uh, thank you guys very much for your time. Thank you so much for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Dr. I'm Michael Lightman to testify, um, followed by Dr. Ernesto Blanco. Blanco. Dr. Lightman, you may begin when you are ready. Thank you. Starts now. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Rivera, members of the committee. My name is Mike Lightman. I'm a general surgeon. And I've been practicing in New York City hospitals for more than 36 years. I'm currently the Dean for Graduate Medical Education at Mount Sinai, and I have the privilege of being responsible for the largest GME program in the United States with more than 2,600 residents, interns, and fellows learning and working at eight Mount Sinai Health System hospitals and two campuses at h, h The testimony that we've heard today is very compelling. Five years ago, I learned of the death by suicide of a Mount Sinai resident. She was beautiful, intelligent, well-liked, and well-regarded, and her death had a major impact on me and on Mount Sinai. She was not the first New York City resident that died by suicide, nor the last. Until six years ago, we were focused on resident duty hours, supervision, patient safety, and education. At this very moment, there are, are 14,000 interns, residents, and fellows on duty, as Dr. Omatosa described, on the front lines at our New York City hospitals. The negative impact of burnout is that it not only affects the physician, it may also result in impact to patients, coworkers, family members, close friends, and our healthcare organizations. Burnout and depression are not the result of working excessive duty hours. Rather, they are the result of the intensity of the work that residents do, 
the need to study and pass examinations, and as you've heard, the moral injury that one experiences when they spend a lifetime preparing to practice medicine, only to learn that there are limits on the ability of treatments for certain diseases and for patients with limited resources. Working conditions are better than they were generations ago when people like me worked excessive hours as a resident. There is now around the clock supervision and instruction from dedicated teaching faculty. But the intensity of the work based upon the need to treat many, often very ill hospitalized patients in even more complex healthcare environments does take its toll on intern and resident wellness and their health. Six years ago, we began to measure burnout and depression utilizing well-accepted scientifically validated survey tools. The majority of our residents completed the survey and we found that 57% of our residents screened positive for burnout and 40% of our residents screened positive for depression. In some programs, depression was as high as 80% of residents and burnout was measured to be as high as 92%. We also found other factors that increased well-being such as having departmental well-being champions and promoting team building support, uh, support for families of international medical graduates, investing in food pantries and group meetings to learn techniques for building resilience were important. We invested in the well-being uh, screening tools that the American Foundation for Prevention of Suicide uh, has uh, enabled us to uh, give our residents self-screening tools. We've invested in mental health services and supporting interns and residents with physician's assistance and nurse practice inspired. where possible. We carefully monitor all of our residents for signs of stress, and each year the majority of our residents complete wellness surveys. And we've done much, to, much research in terms of learning how to mitigate the effect of training on young physicians. Here are a few examples of what we provide at Mount Sinai. We hold support sessions led by social workers and psychologists. We have a 24-7 Helpline that provides trained counselors to answer phone calls to help and create uh, connections to emotional care. We have regular town halls for our residents and we provide safe transportation for our residents off hours. We've been providing wellness days for our residents in Bella since 2016. In summary, New York City's interns and residents play an important frontline provider role as they undergo necessary training to develop the skills required for independent practice. But there is still a crisis in the wellness of our junior physicians that's, that takes a toll on their personal and professional lives, negatively impacts patients and ultimately the health of our city. More research and resources, as you've heard today, are necessary to understand how to mitigate this problem and invest in a healthier physician workforce for a healthier New York. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. I'd like to now welcome Dr. Ernesto Blanco to testify. You may begin when you are ready. Time starts now. Thank you very much. Uh, my name, as I said, is Dr. Ernesto Blanco. Uh, I was an internal medicine resident at Coney Island Hospital from 2017 to 2020. Uh, I honestly must have been very compelled by the stories I've been listening to. Uh, I feel like it really highlights how we in different hospitals lived the similar, similar realities. And it is definitely a shared experience. Uh, I think you've heard many stories about how the hours and the immense amount of adult out of work where it will wear uh, resident down, it will cause burnout. Uh, and this was definitely true in my experience in Coney Island. And as the previous speaker mentioned, it is consistent with the statistics. Burnout tends to be less of a strategy and more the norm. Um, I do wanna be clear that the only reason I feel like I'm here to be able to stay in this is because I am no longer employed at Coney Island and I'm, I'm gonna attend the physician in another state. And, if, if this was happening perhaps when I was arrested, I think I might have hesitated to speak because sometimes it does seem a culture, there does seem to exist a culture of retaliation and that's targeted by well, higher ups uh, or, or at least just made to feel that, that this environment exists to where residents cannot speak out. Uh, the culture of Coney was not a, a one that valued and championed residents' physical or mental health. Uh, at the very least, it felt like the opposite to us. It felt like every year a new responsibility, a new idle title task was being added to us. And there wasn't much of a choice from the resident standpoint. There wasn't a negotiation. It was just, we're informing you. Uh, as an international medical graduate, I particularly had a very tough situation. I am from Venezuela and in 2019, uh, because of many different uh, political problems in my country, uh, my country had 
no way to be contacted for over a week. There was no internet, there was no electricity. Obviously this affected me extremely emotionally and mentally. And I figured I needed some time off. It was negotiated that I would have four days off. But I guess, again, because of this culture of how mental health is looked at, I was within the second day called back that this was not the way of dealing with things that it needed to be at the hospital, that I should be able to deal with this better, not really understanding what that meant. I told this story, I remember, uh, so we try to get wellness days during the CIR negotiations. And I remember the shock looks and the uncomfortable uh, ambiance that it created. And, but at the time, I, I feel like it's insufficient that we were just trying to accomplish these two wellness days. Uh, it really speaks to the whole situation that residents are on that we're fighting to see if we can get two uncontested wellness days for residents a year where they can just focus on their mental health. Um, as I have CR delegate at Coney, I regularly felt that we did have Time expired. issues that we're facing, but we weren't really listened to. It was actually pretty impressive that the one thing we were supported on was a one day commitment to do kind of a wellness day party. And well, you know what? Well, this was a nice gesture. It did feel insufficient because it was not addressing the long term issues that were, as many of us have spoken of today, causing the, the severe amount of burnout in our residents. Um, I think I stress that one of the reasons I feel I can speak up freely today is because it's no longer work at Coney Island. And perhaps my future was not something that I would feel was compromised if I put myself out there as I had before to try to speak up for others. Because I'm in a position now, I feel like I, I felt like I must speak I, as I was a delegate for CIR, and it was always in my uh, interest to advocate for other residents. Um, I think as others, we want to be there to help our communities but our mental health and physical health should also be a priority because we will not be able to do the best that we can if we are not taken out of as well. I feel like the conditions that I experience place undue burdens on me and my training and my fellows training. And I do hope that we shed light on the struggles that we face and that we, and that we get your support uh, and support for CIR to move forward and for international support for residents and physicians, for system-wide oversight so that programs are held accountable and for change. I think only then can we change the culture and raise the standards both at Coney and across all of H and H residency programs. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your testimony. Um, I'd like to now turn it to Chair Rivera for any questions. I, I wanted to um, ask uh, Dr. Chalvoy, uh, Carrie Ann. I'm not sure if you're still with us. I I wanted to ask you. I know you had, I feel like you had a little bit more to say and I wanted to ask whether there was something additional, another story you wanted to share with us. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, uh, Chairwoman Rivera. Um, I wanted to share a bit more um, about the Patient Care Trust Fund, but first I, I, we received a very um, moving anonymous story from a resident about sort of how, what the day-to-day -day is like. I think we've heard some very poignant examples um, but uh, I, I think that this resident spoke very eloquently about what is like on a daily basis. And so I quote, um, it is hard to know where to start. I'm tapping this on my phone as I leave at 10 p.m. from a shift that went 16 hours instead of 12 hours as scheduled. Over several years as a resident, I've worked many 100 plus hour weeks and 30 plus hour shifts, but no extra pay, rarely any sleep on call, often no time to eat, drink or pee and have been talked into changing hours reporting under the th hours reporting under the threat that we would lose resident funding from ACGME if we get the program in trouble. We do transport, labs, vitals, cleaning. I was most burnt out and hurt when working like this, often sick and dehydrated and dangerously sleep deprived and trying to get my patients in into the care they need that they deserve as human beings. And those efforts were met with grossly inadequate and unequal resources for our vulnerable patients in poverty, often also incarcerated or homeless. I felt shame and humiliation when I was then chastised and pushed to reform my time wasting, for example, slowing down clinic by trying to help a cognitively impaired patient recently admitted with a life-threatening blood clot 
to navigate the hospital's exemption system for getting their prescriptions. We have completely unsafe and impossible patient loads with inadequate staffing. We often don't have basic equipment like blankets or blood glucose test strips. They shame and blacklist residents who speak out. We can't get essential medications like seizure medicines in an emergency on time. The exhaustion and misery are palpable and a good day for me means that I've had enough energy to get to the shower or couch to cry instead of crying on my floor. I would love to have a child now, but I do not because it would be impossible in my program though um, it is not for men. And still I'm constantly grateful. My life is infinitely easier than the lives of my patients who die of preventable and treatable diseases, suffering in unspeakable ways down the street from VIPs. I feel utterly hopeless sometimes in the face of this all, but my colleagues and I keep showing up with whatever we have. So I think with that testimony um, from that resident, I think uh, really captures the experience on the day to day. And you can understand why the depression rates are so high as we recently heard. Um, I think uh, something related that I wanted to just uh, speak a bit more about is the patient care trust fund, which it has been a, a really, um, helpful outlet amid all of this uh, work, um, the work culture for uh, residents in the H&H &H system. Um, so the Patient Care Trust Fund uh, is, uh, provides health and hospitals house staff with critical funding to reduce health disparities, strengthen medical education, and meet the complex health needs of our patients and communities through annual equipment and holiday grants and biannual research grants. Um, reviewing patient care trust fund applications from H and H residents was really one of the re most rewarding experiences of my residency and my life, and I was really honored to serve as the chair of that board last year. Um, equipment and resource uh, shortages make it harder and slower to treat our patients, and it all results in longer and longer hours for us and more and more frustration, as we've mentioned how these um, these ideas tie into each other between resources and well-being. When we lack the resources we need to treat our patients, we stop practicing medicine based on what is the best treatment plan and instead based on what's achievable. It takes creativity, time, and a huge emotional cost to provide the best quality care under those conditions, but that's what we put in each day. Our patients deserve better, and this is a moral injury. Um, uh, I, I just want to share a brief example of the impact that the patient care trust fund grants have on our patients and communities, as well as our well-being as residents, um, not only for those of us who are um, on the board of residents who approve these grants, um, but for the residents who receive them. For years, Coney Island Hospital lacked a proper sonogram in its labor and delivery wing. Uh, OBGYN residents were forced to use a 10-year-old malfunctioning sonogram to care for the estimated 1,800 patients served by their department each year. Shocked by these conditions, a resident leader stepped up and was sent to the PCTF by the hospital because administration said it didn't have the money for a new machine. Despite the high patient need and the fact that residents must complete 60 bedside sonograms in order to graduate. In the resident's application, they narrate a truly painful and sadly very common scene. One time, our, extern our external fetal monitor was no longer able to differentiate fetal from maternal heart rate and there was concern for prolonged fetal bradycardia, a dangerously low heart rate. We weren't able to confirm our suspicions due to the lack of a functioning sonogram, and the patient was taken to the OR for a stat cesarean section, an operation which could have been avoided if we simply had a sonogram that worked. Um, so I just, you know, I, I appreciate having the opportunity to take this time to also highlight some of the programs like the Patient Care Trust Fund that we have that really make a difference for our well-being and for patients, um, and that we only wish we could approve more of the applications that we receive to make differences for us and for all New Yorkers. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Um, I'd like to, at this point, we've concluded our public testimony. I'd like to just ask if we had inadvertently missed anyone that is registered to testify today and has yet to be called please use a zoom raise hand function now and you'll be called on in the order in which you have raised your hand okay seeing no hands um, i'm going to turn it back to chair rivera for closing remarks i just want to say thank you to you all i i 
accessing wellness days and days off are incredibly important. And I know something was mentioned on in terms of a wellness activity over Zoom. And again, I know that our institutions are trying to do the right thing. And I, and I appreciate that they are still here listening to you all. So just so you know, they are still in this meeting listening. So I wanna thank everyone for being here, for sharing your story. I realize the pressure to be infallible, to work nonstop is not fair, it's not sustainable, and it's not realistic. You do, many of you continue to suffer in silence and as much empowerment as you may be given as is, is really just perception is, is what it, it feels like. And it's clear that improved working conditions, more staff, more resources, that is the intervention needed to have a more profound effect. So that way workers are not feeling like they're alone with their finger in the dam. Think moral injury will compound the problems if we do not act now. Health and hospitals, the Greater New York Hospital Association, they can do something system wide so that our interns, our residents, our workers, can lead with empathy and they can become the amazing and appreciated individuals and doctors that they have always strived to be. We don't wanna lose talent and we cannot lose another life. I'm looking forward to working with every single one of you to implement immediate changes. I know we're capable of it. I know we can do something system-wide. And I wanna thank all of you uh, for being here. Of course, I wanna thank the entire council team, the Committee on Interns and Residents, Health and Hospitals, Greater New York. Uh, thank you so, so much. Um, again, I will not stop until we see some changes. And I wanna just thank you for taking what is actually brave, bold action to be here and speak frankly and honestly and authentically to your experiences. So with that, um, we will adjourn the hearing and thanks again to everyone for being here.